The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning. Uh, we commence with an acknowledgement of country. We wish to acknowledge uh, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, the Royal Commission is uh, meeting this week, and to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose land uh, I am uh, participating in this hearing, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, from whose lands Ms Bennett of Council is appearing. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people attending the hearing in person today, as well as those who are viewing the hearing on the live stream. Yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, Commissioners, and to everyone following the broadcast and the proceedings in the hearing room in Adelaide. Our first witness is Karen Rogers, and you'll see that she's here in the witness box with her son, Daniel, by her side. <laughs> you'll see a, a photo of him, and she's our first witness today. Ms Rogers, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission in Adelaide to give your evidence. We very much appreciate your attendance. Would you be good enough uh, to listen, to follow the associate who will uh, administer the oath uh, to you? Thank you very much. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Rogers. Now, uh, Ms Eastman will ask you some questions just to make sure you're aware. Uh, of course, uh, two commissioners are in the same room as you are in Adelaide, that is Commissioner McEwen and Commissioner Bennett and uh, I am remote from Sydney, so I'm in Sydney. Ms Eastman will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Um, Ms Rogers, you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission. Yes, that's correct. And you've got a copy with you. Yes. And your name is Karen Rogers. Yes, that's you've correct. You've provided your address to the Royal Commission. I have. And you work as a, a, in the disability sector as an advocate, is that right? Well, I did until November last year, and now I'm at home. Okay. You've prepared um, the statement and you've read it before coming today? Yes, I have. And is it true? It's true. Now, you've decided that what you'd like to do today is to read your statement, and at different points we're going to stop and pause, and we either have some photographs or videos that you want to share with the Royal Commission and I'll ask you some questions as we go along. So are you happy with that approach? Yes, that's All good, right. thank you. So can I um, invite you to start reading your statement and perhaps we can start at paragraph three. Sure. Um, my name's Karen Lee Rogers. I'm 60 years old and I live in Adelaide with my husband, Graham, and my son, Daniel. I retired in November 2020 after 25 years uh, um, in a career in the disability sector. Immediately before I retired, I worked at the, as a project leader on the Our Voice SA program, a peer advocacy program for people with intellectual disability or learning disability, auspiced by Julie Farr Purple Orange and funded by the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA. In this role, I was responsible for, for supporting the peer advocacy group at meetings, as well as liaising with South Australian politicians, senior bureaucrats, and people within the South Australian Department of Human Services. Prior to working at Our Voice SA, I worked as an accommodation manager at CARA from August 2014 to August 2018. I also worked as an advocate for 10 years prior to my time at CARA, in a number of organisations, including Autism SA and Parent Advocacy. <clears throat> I continue to do voluntary work in the disability sector as a member of the board of Home Place, an organisation that provides accommodation and lifestyle support to people with disability in South Australia, and as a community visitor with the South Australian Community Visitors Scheme. I started my training with the Community Visitor Scheme in February 2019 and began visits in June 2019. My son Daniel is my second child. 
Daniel was born on the 8th of November, 1980. There are several photographs that you will see of Daniel further on. Daniel is beautiful. He's a lovely man who is very gentle and very sweet. Daniel's favourite things are sticks, Christmas carol, carols and Abba. Since he was young, his favourite hobby has been collecting sticks and twigs. He breaks them into small pieces and collects them in containers and buckets. We have several buckets of sticks at our house. Since moving home, Daniel has learned how to make artwork with these sticks. And um, he's learned how to make, we've bought bird houses and coasters and bowls and he's covered them with his sticks and they're lovely. When he had his 40th birthday party, he made a coaster for everyone who came and there were over 100 people there. Daniel loves to sing. He likes television jingles, he likes hymns and anthems and theme songs. He's a Port Power supporter, only because he's forced to be, really, by living in our house. Um, but he likes to also sing the Adelaide Crows song, which is very sad. He has very good memory, and he can remember the lyrics to many, many songs. Before I had surgery on an ankle recently, Daniel and I walked together almost every day near our home. On our walks, I often picked a flower and gave it to Daniel because I think the smell being sensory is really good for Daniel. Often though, he would hold on to the flower and when we went to the cafe for a coffee, he would choose someone and walk over and give the flower to them. Daniel has very limited speech and a limited ability to articulate himself meaningful, meaningfully or have interactive conversations. When Daniel doesn't want to go somewhere or do something, for, um, for example, if I put vegetables on his plate, he will say, don't want it. He has echolalia, which means he repeats the words and phrases that he hears. When Daniel was four years old, he was diagnosed with severe intellectual disability and epilepsy. It was another four years before Daniel was diagnosed with autism. I took Daniel to see doctors on a number of times because I suspected something was wrong. Before Daniel received a diagnosis, these doctors dismissed my concerns and told me it was all because I was a young mother. When Daniel was young, he was difficult. He often only slept two hours at night, and even that was in bits and pieces. He regularly had tantrums, and at times he screamed, bit, pinched, and pulled hair. He also bit himself quite badly too. He was regularly suspended from school due to his behaviour. Daniel was nicknamed Little Houdini as a child because there were no locks, doors or fences that were Daniel proof. He regularly disappeared from our home, his respite care and even from school. Even affording myself the self-indulgence of going to the toilet could result in Daniel escaping. In 1992, when Daniel was 11 years old, I was pregnant with twins. We already weren't coping with Daniel, despite doing everything we could. And we were told by someone who was very experienced in the disability sector, the twins would be in peril if Daniel were to remain in our family home. At the time, I was not aware of any options for supported accommodation for children with disability in Adelaide. Social workers suggested that I relinquish Daniel and have him enter the foster system. I was against doing that because I knew I couldn't cope. I wanted to maintain an active role in Daniel's life and for him to continue to have relationships with his sister and his soon-to-be brothers. Those things were very important to me. In mid-1992, when I was in the latter part of my pregnancy with the twins, three boys of a similar age to Daniel were relinquished into respite care and permanent accommodation arrangements were set up for these boys by the IDSC, a South Australian government agency that provided accommodation to other services for people with intellectual disability. I am so thankful to those other parents for having the courage to do what I could not. <clears throat> so pausing there, you um, and Daniel have prepared a, a video for the Royal Commission so that the commissioners can meet Daniel and get a sense of a day in the life of Daniel and uh, the, the things he's particularly interested in. Yeah. So we'll see some of his artwork and some of his singing. Yes, I apologise for the sound because in some 
areas, it's not that great. Okay. So we'll just take a moment and the video will be queued up and then that will be played. And the video will take about four minutes. Okay, today we're going to talk about Daniel. Daniel's a 40-year-old man who lives with autism, epilepsy, intellectual disability and movement disorder. And I want you to see a really lovely side of Daniel because he has a very beautiful side. There are so many lovely things about Daniel and it's really important that you meet him. Would well, Daniel like two biscuits? Um, yes, please. Okay. Um, when Daniel goes to bed at night, he likes the teddies on the bed, um, but when he goes to bed at night, he kicks them all off on the floor. So when he gets up in the morning, he, he and I make the bed together and then he puts all the teddies back into bed. I've been to bed. And he says, I've been to bed to them. I've been to bed. I've been to bed. Well, go and get some sticks. I've got a bag for you. Huh? To go and get some sticks. It's got the sorts of sticks that Daniel likes to break. I'm not sure what sort of tree this is. I think it's a gum tree, but this is his favourite type of tree. And when we get to the park, he comes straight to this tree. Bam! Thumbs up. Yes. We went to the park. The park, yeah, and we got some Boots. sticks. Excellent. Talk to Mummy what this is. Cop. Cop. Yeah. Cop shop. Is that cop shop? Yes, please. Oh, you want it on now? Do you want cop shop on now? Yes, please. He's doing his sticks though at the same time, so breaking up sticks and watching cop shop is good fun for him. Rudolph Reynolds reindeer. And if you ever you would even say you go down in history. Daniel um, Daniel needs help in the shower, he needs help in the bathroom, um, he needs help with his shave because he can't get it exactly right. My sister-in-law says he looks like a newsreader um, because he's so handsome. Uh, but he does need assistance with shaving. Even if he didn't have a beard, he would need assistance because he doesn't, he misses lots of bits. Mm -hmm. Good job. When Daniel's finished his shave every day, he takes the cap off of it and blows the whiskers into the sticks. Go for a walk on the beach. He's beating me to it. Alright, Daniel. Go for a walk, mate, down the beach. Oh, he loves to go for walks down the beach. Amazing when we go down here, he always finds a stick somewhere. Every time we go for a walk, he likes to put himself with a few sticks, packs them, breaks them up at home. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Daniel today and seeing the lovely side of him. There's so much good in Daniel. Since he's come home, he's grown, he's developed, and he has um, he's travelled a long distance. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's in the future. that video and also to your husband Graham and to Daniel for sharing us a, a little insight into your life. So I want to take you back now in your statement where you start to talk about Daniel's journey through care and uh, we're up to paragraph 23 so tell me when you're ready to start and, and we'll start at paragraph 23. Okay on July the 12th 
1992, just days before the twins were born, Daniel became the fir fourth person to move into the IDSC house in Torrensville, which I will now refer to as Haywood Avenue. In around 2000, one of the men that lived with Daniel became ill and moved to Strathmont Centre, a government-run institution providing accommodation for people with disability, only leaving three, minute, uh, three boys at that stage at Haywood. In about 2004, 2005, the other men who lived at Haywood moved to Strathmont to an empty villa as the Haywood Avenue property required extensive work. Shortly after that, Daniel and the two other men moved from that to a house that I will refer to as N Street. There were three IDSC houses on that same street that provided accommodation service to people with disability. Two of the houses, including the house that Daniel moved into, were built by the spastic centres of South Australia. So the house had wide doors and hallways with big indoor spaces which suited Daniel. At the time Daniel moved in, the house still had the old institutional bathrooms um, with a few showers in the same room. In this statement, um, I will refer to that house, as I said, as N Street. I understood that N Street was owned by a housing association, but the accommodation services were provided by the South Australian Government. During the time that Daniel lived at N Street, his accommodation services were always provided by the South Australian Government, but the name of the service provider changed from time to time. It, it was first IDSC, the Intellectual Disability Services Council. It went to Options Coordination, then to Disability SA, and finally to the Department of Human Services. When Daniel first moved to N Street in 2004 to 2000, I'm not sure of the exact dates, uh, he lived there with the two other young men who had lived with him at Haywood Avenue and at the Strathmont Centre. After a couple more years, a fourth resident moved in. The other houses on N Street each housed three or four people with disability, each of whom I understood to have similar needs to Daniel. Daniel and the other residents at N Street attended structured activities on off-site services known as day options during the week. DHS support workers organised activities for them on the weekend. Day options were individually negotiated by me on behalf of Daniel. I organised for Daniel to go to a different day option to the other three residents at N Street. I did this deliberately because I felt they lived together through circumstance, not by choice, and I didn't think they should be together 24 hours a day. Um, from around 2006, Daniel's day option was at a farm called Windermere Park. As far as I recall, the time that Daniel lived at N Street, there were staff at the house all the time. There were one or two support workers on shift during the day and one support worker on shift throughout the night. The support workers at N Street were supervised by a shift supervisor who supervised a few different houses. The shift supervisor reported to a manager working in the DHS offices. Over the years that Daniel lived at Hayward Avenue and N Street, my family and I maintained very active involvement in his life. Daniel had regular visits from his family, generally on at least a weekly basis. On some occasions when I was not able to get there, Daniel's sister and brothers and sometimes his grandparents have made sure they take him out on a weekend for a whole day, or if that was not possible, at least a meal out. There have never been any formal guardianship or financial administration orders in place for Daniel. I generally attended medical appointments with Daniel and a DHS staff member usually attended too. At those medical appointments, I was consulted about Daniel's care, both by the doctor and the DHS staff member. I was, um, when I was consulted, I made decisions about care for Daniel or medication with input from the medical professions, professionals and the accommodation services manager. I largely relied on support workers, shift supervisors and accommodation managers to keep me informed about any relevant medical issues for Daniel. In terms of financial decision making, I understood 
from my professional experience in the disability sector that DHS received a, pen, a percentage of the client's disability support pension on a board and lodgings basis. And I am aware that the same arrangements were in place for Daniel when he lived at End Street. I was aware that there was an amount of money from that disability support pension that was for Daniel's use. That was transferred into a trust account, Daniel's account. I understood from accommodation service managers that Daniel's account was administered through an internal financial department for DHS. I had no access to Daniel's account and I did not receive bank statements for that account. I was not privy to the records kept at End Street about Daniel's, about Daniel, including reports or records about how his money was spent. I do not know what the formal arrangements were for authorising expenditure of Daniel's money from his account. So far as I was aware, DHS managed his finances and personal affairs with some consultation with me, particularly for large pur purchases. It was my expectation that Daniel would be given a weekly allowance and he would use these, this for expenses such as takeaway food and outings. Decision making for Daniel continued more or less in this way until he moved out of End Street into my home in February 2019, although his finances continued to be managed by DHS for a year. Daniel lived at End Street for about 15 years. In that time, I learned a lot about how best to advocate for my son. I learned to pick my battles and raise things only that I thought was absolutely necessary to be addressed. Otherwise, I was conscious of the need to maintain strong relationships with the staff and with DHS. I had good relationships with some workers over the years. I have outlined the issues that became acute for me and Daniel in the later years of his time at, Norm at um, N Street. Over the years, Daniel lived at N Street. I found his standard of grooming and hygiene could be quite variable. It was not such an issue I felt I needed to raise it initially. However, from 2017, I noted that Daniel was sometimes dressed in clothes that looked like they didn't belong to him, and at times he smelled, often of faeces and very bad breath, when we came to pick him up on Sundays. Generally, if an issue like of that kind arose, I spoke with the accommodation services manager. He was generally understanding and said that he would raise issues with the workers but I didn't notice any significant improvement to Daniel's standards of grooming or hygiene. While Daniel was living at End Street, there was an occasion when my husband and I took Daniel on a holiday. This trip required substantial planning. I provided a long list of things to be packed and the dates of the trip to the accommodation service manager, Wayne Cunningham. <coughs> Wayne provided this to, um, this to staff by email at least a week before the trip. However, on the day of our departure, I called and they'd told me they'd forgotten about the trip. When we arrived to pick Daniel up for the holiday, his bags were packed. However, when we got to Melbourne, we found that other people's clothing has been packed rather than Daniel's own. I also found that staff had not packed enough medication to last the week. This meant we had to cut our holidays short and return to Adelaide, as Daniel was on a complicated medica medication regime, with some requiring special permissions, so it was not going to be possible to get them replaced in Melbourne. When we returned to Adelaide, I called Wayne and explained why we'd be back from our holiday early, because staff had not um, packed enough medication. Wayne apologised for what had happened. So we're going to pause there and I want to ask you just a few questions about the financial arrangements. Sure. <clears throat> and we're about to touch on a topic where the financial arrangements became very relevant to you. But uh, over the time that Daniel lived at N Street, do you recall having any discussions with anyone about the financial arrangements? On occasions, I would say that if he needed something, um, often we provided things that he needed. Um, staff would let me know if he was running short of jeans or something like that. Um, but we would have discussions that, you know, they could go and purchase 
items that he needed, but that was as far as it went. And do you know whether, uh, in terms of Daniel himself, whether there was ever any uh, education or training for him to understand managing his own money mm. and being able to make decisions about what he wanted to spend his money on? Um, Daniel would have had difficulty understanding the concept of finances, um, but even now, if we go and purchase something for Daniel, we always take him with us if we're purchasing clothes, and we always show him the clothing and give him the opportunity to choose which clothing he would like. And would it be fair to say that when Daniel first went into care, then at that stage you just relied on the department to manage all aspects of his life, but you were still his guardian, were you not, till he was the age of 18? Yes, that's correct. I was still, and I was still his mother, and as a mother, that, that just came naturally, that I was the person who was contacted with issues. Um, initially, he, didn't, he wasn't in receipt of a disability support pension, um, but as he got older, and when he did become, when he did um, get, uh, when he did receive a pension, then we actually, um, we were happy for him to enter the same arrangements as most people in then IDSC care and that they had a financial department that oversaw that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a good thing because I didn't have to worry about paying bills and things like that. And was it the case that because those arrangements for Daniel in terms of where he was living and how he was living his life really continued from when he was 18 and to become an adult, that no one gave any direct thought to, well, what do we need to do now that he's 18? Do we need to examine what we do around a guardianship relationship? Do we need to think about, as an adult, how might he manage his money or what applications we would make for support pensions and the like? Mm -hmm. Do you have any memory about what um, happened when he turned 18? Look, I, from, my, from my understanding and my recollections of those times, um, I had talked to people from SACAT, which is a South Australian um, Civil and Administrative Tribunal, used to be called the Guardianship Board. I would talked to people from the Guardianship Board and asked, did they feel that I needed to make applications? And they had said no. You know, um, I could... Whenever Daniel was at hospital or having any treatment, I went anyway. And as his mother, I was able to sign for him to have any treatment. Um, with the finances, I was really happy to just leave them to DHS to sort out. All right. Well, that might then t take us back to your statement, to that part starting from paragraph 43, because this is when the issues around the finances and expenditure became a, a matter of concern yes. that you felt you needed to raise with the department. So can I ask you to take up reading again from paragraph sure. 43. Yep. Um, on October the 20th, 2018, I was telephoned, telephoned by a support worker who I will call ABL. ABL asked if he could purchase new pillows and bedding um, using the funds that Daniel had accumulated. I agreed, but asked that they take Daniel to the shops to buy the items. ABL informed me that this was not possible because Daniel was asleep. Because it was already 4.30 on a Saturday and the shops were about to close, I suggested that I would take Daniel to the shops the following day. ABL was reluctant um, to proceed in this way. I asked him if they had already purchased the bedding and was told no. However, when I arrived the next day, I found the bedding had been purchased. I viewed the receipt, which showed that the purchase, valued at around $270, was made at 3.30pm the day before. The following day, I wrote a letter of complaint to Wayne Cunningham, the manager, outlining my concerns in full. I was troubled that my permission had been sought after the fact and worried about the staff member not being truthful. Um, can I put you attached. there? So you've included for the Royal Commission a copy of the letter. And yes. Commissioners, you'll find that behind tab 10 in hearing bundle A. And Ms Rogers, have you got that letter with you as well? Yes. All right. Yeah. So if you look at the document behind tab 10. 
Yes. And that's the letter that you sent to Mr Cunningham? Yes, that's correct. And you say the bottom of the letter, if I can just draw your attention to that. Mm -hmm. I let a lot of things go, but this is deceptive behaviour by the staff involved, and it concerns me that if they would lie to me about this, and yes, I would have been annoyed that they didn't include Daniel in the shopping trip, what else will they lie about? I am disappointed to say the least. So this is, uh, this was a significant event. Some people might say, oh, it's just, you know, an oversight and maybe Daniel didn't want to go. There might be an explanation behind this. But for you, you wanted to raise it because it went to a question of trust. Is that right? There were several things involved in this, which are in, in the letter too. Um, but one of them is that to pay that exorbitant amount for a quilt, um, for a comforter, for someone who has nighttime incontinence really bothered me. Um, and the fact that Daniel wasn't included in the purchase bothered me, and the fact that I was lied to bothered me. So I had several issues with this, um, this occurrence. Okay. All right, can I take you back to pick up from where you left off? So we were at the end of paragraph 45, so yep. starting at 46. Mm -hmm. Um, just weeks after this incident, I followed up on my complaint with Wayne. He told me that the complaint had been escalated to the Incident Management Unit, the IMU, within DHS. But it had been referred back to Wayne to deal with at a local level. He said that he had been following up with the staff and that the staff member became upset. He stated there were some issues at, at N Street and that... Um, was the extent of the resolution to that complaint. Uh, these issues continued and um, it increasingly troubled me from 2017, in part because things didn't seem to be improving for Daniel. However, I felt it was a situation that I could work with. My view changed following some unexplained bruising in October 2018 and in February 2019, which I will describe. October 2018, on the 28th of October, the week after I had complained, when Graham and I picked Daniel up, he was wearing a jacket. When we got home, I removed the jacket and I saw some bruises on Daniel's inner arm. The bruises were close together and they looked about the size of a forefinger. I asked Daniel what had happened and he growled. I can't remember his exact words. Um, I took a photo of the bruising and those photos are here. All right, so um, you have said that you'd like the Royal Commissioners to see the photographs, so we'll put them up on the screen, but can I give anybody watching the uh, hearing, either here in the hearing room or also online, that there's a number of photographs that we'll now show in relation to the bruising on Daniel that may be confronting and this is the first set of photographs. There's some more to come. So I'll just give that warning to anyone who might be distressed uh, before we show those photographs so that they can take a break and resume with us as we go along. Commissioners, you'll find the copy of the photographs behind tab 11 and tab 12 in hearing bundle A. All right, so Ms Rogers, we'll just put those up. So these are photos that you took at the time. You noticed the bruising. Yes, they are. And um, given the nature of the bruising, that concerned you and you thought you needed to report it. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Yes. And um, so we've had those photos up. Can I take you now to paragraph 49? Yes. You can tell the Royal Commission what did you do when you took those photographs. I emailed a copy of these photographs to Wayne Cunningham on that day. I no longer have a copy of the email. Um, I, later I had a later phone call with Wayne, during which he told me he had again referred the incident to the IMU. I'm not aware of the outcome of the referral or whether the bruising was investigated. It was investigated. I had seen some minor bruises or other unexplained minor injuries on Daniel in the past. However, the bruises I saw on Daniel's arm concerned me because of the size and proportion made me think they were caused by someone grabbing Daniel's arm. I was worried 
as the bruises appeared the week after I made a complaint about the bedding, and I was concerned that in some way this was connected to my complaint, and it made me more alert to similar injuries happening again. All right, and then you, you say you didn't notice any further bruising on Daniel until February 2019, and uh, the events that you're about to describe and read in your statement were very significant events. So take your time, and if yep. you feel that you want me to jump in and read some of the paragraphs, I'm very happy to do so. But let's start with paragraph 52. Okay, on February the 22nd, 2019, at 5.54pm, 5, at 5 I received a phone call from a support worker who I will call ABM. ABM informed me that Daniel had a large bruise on his back and he asked me if it was okay to call a locum doctor. I absolutely agreed. At 8.33 that night, the locum doctor called me. The locum told me he felt that Daniel needed to be checked at the hospital for internal bleeding. He recommended we take Daniel to the hospital. I asked ABM to take Daniel to the hospital and said, Graham and I would meet them there. N Street was only five minutes from the drive from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and we were about 20 minutes away. When Graham and I arrived at the hospital, Daniel was sitting in the waiting room of the emergency department with another support worker who I will call ABN, and a night supervisor. While we were in the waiting room, I looked at the bruising on Daniel's back, and I was shocked to see the extent of the bruising around Daniel's waist, going from his spine to in the front of his kidneys. <coughs> I took two photographs of those bruises and um, copies of those will probably come up now. Right. So you, you want to show those um, photographs as yes. well? Yes, right. and so I don't want to show the third photograph, although so we'll the commissioners will see that. But so commissioners, the three photographs, the two that we'll show appear behind tab 13, in the bundle and tab 14. You have an additional photo at tab 15, but the one at tab 15 will not appear on the screen. All right, so Ms Rogers, um, can I just uh, ask you so that commissioners can see the angles of it. So that first photo where uh, Daniel has the T-shirt on, so it's on a slight angle, so can you just explain to us sort of what the, the yes, angle was, was and how you took that photo? Yeah, he was standing in the um, waiting room in the emergency department and I took the photo from my phone. The second photo I took was when he was laying on the bed in the emergency department. Okay, so the, what is depicted on the first photograph is, uh, that's Daniel's Back. Yes, so sorry, that's can, Daniel. So back you can see from, from his the side. bruising uh, continue from about the middle of Daniel's back and it continues round to his side where the photograph ends. Yeah. And the second photograph is the continuation of the bruise, so on the on Daniel's front. Yes. And that's the photo that you took when he was lying down, is that right? Yes, that's All right. So I hope that assists the commissioners to see the nature and extent of the bruising. In the so you were shocked when you saw this bruising? I was bruising. horrified. Okay. And in the third photograph, which the commissioners yes. will see, which I took the next yes. day at home, and I'm not putting that up because no. it's, it's a photograph when Daniel mm. got out of the shower, but I didn't notice it on the day, but when I look at it, there's actually more bruising down his leg. Yes. which you can see down yes. his leg. Uh, on his upper thigh. Yes. yes, on his upper and part way down his thigh as well, about halfway down his thigh. Okay. Mm. All right, so, um, so you, we're on paragraph 54 and you've described the photographs and we've made the reference there. Can I take you back to <clears throat> what happened when you arrived at the hospital? This is paragraph 55. Sure. Can we take it up from there? Yes. Shortly after Graham and I arrived at the hospital, the worker returned to N Street to finish his shift. The night supervisor stayed for a while. At some point, he had to go. He came back that night to see how Daniel was going. I stayed overnight at the hospital um, with Daniel. Daniel required a scan to check for internal bleeding, so it was important that I be here. 
The night in the hospital was not an easy night for Daniel. He's not a cooperative patient, and because he is fearful, especially of needles, staff at the hospital were lovely, and they listened to everything I said. They even put a cartoon on for Daniel. Um, but it's OK if I just describe the process. Yes, of, of course. Um, for Daniel to have any sort of procedure, there is a drug called midazolam, which actually is like a sedative. And for most of us, if we had one vial of midazolam, we would be knocked out, we would be unable to fight, and we probably wouldn't have a recollection of what had happened. Well, for Daniel to have any procedure, he has four vials of midazolam, which are given hidden in a bottle of Coke, and then after that, it takes six security guards to hold him down to even get a needle into his arm. So it was quite a stressful night for him. It, it was, was very stressful frightened. And a stressful night for, the, for you and Graham as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's very sad. It's very difficult for Daniel. So he's terrified. So um, Daniel had scans in the early hours of the Saturday morning. The results revealed no internal damage or bleeding. So Daniel was discharged. I decided we would take him back to our house and where he and I could both have a sleep in quiet and comfort. On the way home, we stopped at the house where Daniel had been living so we could collect Daniel's morning medication. When we drove into the driveway, Daniel became distressed. He held onto his seatbelt constantly and repeatedly saying, don't want it, don't want it. I told Daniel he could stay in the car, but I had to go and get his medication. Then he settled. I went to the house and asked the support worker on night duty, who I will now call ABP, for Daniel's medication. Daniel's medication was packed in clear sachets. ABP gave me only one sachet of tablets, and I knew Daniel had two sachets of tablets of pills in the morning, so I asked him to go back and get the second sachet. He informed me there was only one sachet in Daniel's medication box, but I insisted that he go back and check. And when I looked closer at the sachet, I realised that he had given me a different client's medication. Because the drugs did not look the same as the other clients, and I noticed that the name was on the sachet, I asked him to go back and get Daniel's medication and then drove Daniel home so we could both have some sleep. However, I do have to say that when I told the staff member, I said to him, look, this is not Daniel's medication, this is another client's medication. He said to me, oh, are you sure? I was absolutely sure. So later that day, I called the support worker who had called me the night before to tell me about Daniel's bruises. Daniel and I weren't sure about bringing ba Daniel back to N Street. So just going with Graham, Graham and I. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, Graham and I, sorry. Graham and I weren't sure about bringing Daniel back to N Street, but we trusted ABM and ABN who were on shift. They assured me they would watch Daniel well. They said they would take him to Club Cool, a dance and music event that was on the next day at a local hotel. So we took Daniel back that afternoon. That is my biggest regret. We didn't visit Daniel on the Sunday, as we usually did, because we thought he was going to Club Cool. What's Club Cool? Club Cool is a, um, it's a live music event that's held at the Governor Hindmarsh Hotel, and it's specifically held one Sunday afternoon a month, specifically for people with disabilities to come, and they can eat, and they can have fun, and they can listen to music. Okay. So, mm. Um, sorry. On the Sunday night, I called the workers to see how Daniel was going and they told me they needed to go and do food shopping. So they took Daniel with them instead of going to Club Call. On Sunday the 24th of February, I emailed a staff member at Daniel's Day Option Provider, Windermere Park, and asked if Daniel had been involved in any falls or altercations. On the same day, I emailed Wayne Cunningham and asked him to call me as soon as he got in on the Monday morning. In the morning of Monday the 25th of February, Wayne called me to say he was at the office and I told him I was coming to see him. I drove to the DHS office where Wayne worked and showed him the photographs I had taken of Daniel's bruises. He was distressed, he cried, and he looked like he was in shock. He told me he didn't know anything about the bruising, 
While I was with Wayne, I sent an email from my phone to Muriel Kirkby, the Director of Accommodation Services at DHS, attaching the photographs of Daniel's bruising, and I asked Muriel to call me. She did. We arranged to meet Muriel, Caroline Warren, the Area Manager, and Sandra Wallace, the Regional Manager at, at their house. Graham and I arrived at the house early for the meeting. Daniel was home as he couldn't go to day options due to the hot weather. He looked distressed and he refused to leave his room. We sat in his bedroom for him, waiting for everyone to arrive. In his room, the dust was very thick. The floors and walls were very dirty. It looked like the floors had not been swept for a long time. Staff offered to make Daniel a sandwich. I said that would be great, but Daniel refused to go into the kitchen to eat. Staff brought the sandwich to Daniel's room, but he refused to eat anything. He was onto me very, holding on to me very tightly, and he would not let go of my arm. At one point, I took my hand away to scratch my face, and he became upset and pulled my hand back into his. This was not usual behaviour for Daniel. Muriel, Wayne, Caroline and Sandra arrived at the house for the meeting. I talked to them in Daniel's bedroom. I told them what had happened on the Friday night, that the bruises that had been found on Daniel and that he had been taken to hospital. I also complained about the cleanliness of Daniel's bedroom and more generally, the cleanliness of the house. During the meeting, other clients were coming in and out of Daniel's bedroom while we tried to talk. It was a very awkward situation. Daniel appeared to be quite distressed and I wanted to remove him from the environment quickly. Graham and I packed a few items of Daniel's clothing into his suitcase and we left with an agreement that we would talk to Wayne, Sandra, Caroline and Muriel later about what we should be doing about Daniel's accommodation arrangements. I was told there were several alternatives to that house and I could call them when I was ready to discuss this. Daniel stayed home with us for that week. He didn't attend his day option. Muriel, Sandra and Wayne kept in touch over the following weeks. Sandra rang regularly at least once a week to see how Daniel and I were going and she reminded us about alternative accommodation options that might be available to Daniel. Despite these offers, Graham and I decided that Daniel could not go back, either to live, or especially not to live at End Street. Daniel seemed to be traumatised. He was very unsettled at night, and if we mentioned End Street in a conversation, he became very distressed and he would start hitting himself in the head. Graham and I started referring to the accommodation as NS to stop him becoming distressed. I decided we needed to give him an environment we knew he would be safe and secure in. At the time Daniel moved out of N Street and into our house in February 2019, I was not aware of any plans to close N Street. On February the 26th, 2019, Wayne Cunningham called me and asked me to report Daniel's injury to the police. That evening, I took Daniel to the Port Adelaide Police Station and made a statement. I didn't think at the time the police would even follow this up, as Daniel has very limited speech and had not been able to tell us what had happened to him. Over the course of the next few months, the police investigated the matter. The police sent a specialist communication officer to try and talk to Daniel, but it was deemed that Daniel would be unable to provide a statement. I have not seen a copy of the police report. The police officer who investigated Daniel's injuries told me he investigated for several weeks and he had interviewed and visited, interviewed staff and visited N Street, but he was not able to investigate the matter any further. The police officer mentioned to me that there was a theory that Daniel had had a fall. This was the first time this had been suggested to me and came as a surprise because I had never known Daniel to have a fall or to bruise easily. Following my report to the police on the 26th of February, I was told that DHS would also investigate the incident. I had some professional contact with Muriel Kirkme during the following period of Daniel moving out of the end street and Muriel always asked me how Daniel was going. She told me on a number of occasions that DHS did not have the answers to what had happened or to what had caused the bruising. Muriel apologised 
um, for what had happened to Daniel numerous times, although we never actually received a formal apology from DHS. At some point, I emailed the Windermere um, Park staff, um, sorry, at some point after I emailed the Windermere Park staff member. Just pausing there, so that's the provider of Daniel's, Daniel's day, day option? option. Yes. Um, they replied to my email and told me there had been no altercations or falls involving Daniel that had been reported at Windermere Park, but staff had also seen the bruising on Daniel's back on Monday the 18th of February. On Monday the 4th of March, we decided to drive Daniel back to Windermere Park ourselves. Knowing Daniel's reaction, what had had been when we returned to N Street, he, quite, he appeared quite happy on the drive to Windermere Park. Daniel was singing and when we got to the farm gate, Graham asked Daniel where he was going and Daniel replied with a smile, farm, so we knew he was going to be okay there. I spoke with the Windermere Park staff member when we arrived. She told me that the staff had seen the bruising on the other side of back, Daniel's back earlier that week, but had not reported it to the accommodation service or me. She said it had looked like someone had tried to cover up the bruises with some type of red paint. And when Windermere Park washed the red paint off Daniel, they uncovered the start of the bruising. She told me they also had photographs of the bruising and I asked why they didn't tell me about Daniel's bruising. Sorry, just go, just go back. So you asked why. I asked Not why they hadn't, sorry. I asked why, I asked her why they hadn't told me about Daniel's bruising at the time they discovered it. And I said that if there were any further incidents, I needed to know about them. I was very upset with Windermere Park for not reporting this to me or to DHS. I asked the staff member if they had reported the incident to anyone else, and she said they had reported it to the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Commission on the 28th of February 2019. She provided me with a copy of the report and the incident notification. Now, this is attached. And so, Commissioners, uh, a copy is behind tab 16 in hearing bundle A, and I don't need to take Ms Rogers to that document, but, uh, but you received a, a copy of yes, this from the staff at Windermere Park, is that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was not involved in or consulted about the DHS investigation. Daniel was living with me after February 2019, and IMU never sought to interview him or me. About a year after the bruising occurred, and I think it was a bit longer than a year, we initiated a meeting with Stuart Dodd, the director of the IMU. Stuart told me that DHS investigation was inconclusive and he was unable to provide a copy of the report to me. Stuart said if I wanted to see a copy of the report, I would need to make a freedom of information application. I didn't make the, inf uh, the application because I felt the process would be too onerous and I just didn't have the time or the energy to do so. All right, so I want to ask you a few questions if we can pause there. So first of all, in relation to Windermere Park, and you were told that a report had been made to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, and the reason for that is that with respect to Daniel's day programs, that that was part of his NDIS plan and yes. funding at the time. Yes, that's correct. So Windermere Park was an NDIS registered provider. And so Daniel, if something happened to Daniel while at the day program, that locked <coughs> in the NDIS uh, Quality Safeguards Commission <coughs> reporting line. You understood that? Yes, that's correct. Right. And were you aware of that at the time uh, of this incident? Yes, yes, I was. All right. And in terms of them, if the incident uh, or the bruising had occurred at the home, that was not something that could be reported to the Quality and Safeguards Commission because that was uh, services provided by the state, is that right? Yeah, okay. that's correct. And the state um, were providing in-kind services, so they weren't answerable, I guess, to the um, Quality and Safeguarding Commission. Right. So you understood in terms of the state addressing the issue around how Daniel 
had the bruising and what type of injury he must have sustained to have that level of bruising, that that would be subject to any investigation within the state DHS, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so Mr Cunningham told you that the matter had been reported to the IMU, the Incident Management Unit. Yes. So look at your paragraph 78. Um, is it the case that you were aware that the IMU would conduct an investigation? So you're aware of that? I was aware that they would conduct an investigation and they did tell me that they wouldn't start their investigation until after the police investigation. Right, so you anticipated my question <laughs> so, about just the, in terms of which went first. So if yep. the police were investigating, you're aware IMU would wait until they could commence an investigation yes. pending the police investigation. All right. Now you say in paragraph 78 you weren't involved or consulted about the DHS investigation at, at all? Never. No one um, asked you for the photographs? No one asked for the photographs, although I had already supplied them. Mm. Um, no one ever came and talked to Daniel. I did suggest at one stage that perhaps we could put photographs of staff in front of Daniel to see his reactions, but um, that was not agreed upon. Um, and no one ever came out and asked us what we thought happened. Um, we'd had him the day previously, so no one ever came out and said to us, like, did he have a fall on the Sunday or, um, you know, but because the bruising was starting to come out later on the Monday. So no one ever came and asked us and said, um, how was he on the Sunday? Was he upset? Were there any evidence of anything on the Sunday? Because I would have known because I took him to the toilet a couple of times. And uh, in terms of the way in which the IMU would conduct the investigation, did anyone tell you what that process would be? No. And in terms of uh, the IMU investigation, did you know whether there had been any contact between DHS and Windermere Park? in terms of what you were told at Windermere Park, that the staff washed red paint off? Did you know, Something red. Did you know anything about the exchange of information, if at all, between Windermere Park and DHS? No, I don't know about that, but I do know the police went to Windermere Park. Okay. And in terms of uh, the results of the investigation, are you telling the Royal Commission in paragraph 78 that you had to initiate a meeting with the person in charge of the IMU, that was Mr Dodd? That's correct. But he agreed to have the meeting with you? Yes, he had, we had met with him um, in the early stages when he was telling us that the meeting would, um, would, that they would follow up after the police, but he was going to get back to us and he never ever did. Okay. Um, so we had initiated that meeting which occurred in July the following year. All right, so that's what I just want to ask you timing-wise because um, Ms Boswell says in her statement that on the 8th of July 2020, she had a meeting with you and Graham yeah. and uh, that also, as I understand, included, she says, the Director of Accommodation Services, I don't know whether you know who that was at the time, and the Director of the IMU were present. Yes. And Ms Boswell says she recalls that you were upset that you hadn't been contacted by the director of IMU at the conclusion of the investigation. And uh, Mr Dodd apologised for this. And Ms Boswell says she apologised on behalf of DHS for the failings of the department and the handling of the incidents in relation to uh, the, the bruising. So do you have a recollection of attending that meeting? Yes, I do, okay. yep. And is that the meeting that you're referring to in paragraph 78? So yes. a year or so after yes. the bruising? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's probably closer to 15 months afterwards. But oh, And so it was at that meeting uh, that you say that you asked for a copy of the report? Yes. Right. Ms Boswell doesn't mention that in her statement, but you've got a recollection that you were told at that meeting that if you wanted a copy of the report, you had to make a Freedom of Information That's correct. application. That's yes. right. And you've now seen a copy of that report in, if oh, you've seen in the, yes, in in the, the material medium. from yes. the state. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, commissioners, I'm um, conscious of the time. It's uh, about five past 11. 
and I had said to Ms Rogers that we'll take this bit by bit. So I think we've finished the first hour of what we need to do. So before we turn to part two, which is after leaving N Street, Commissioners, if it's appropriate, we might take a morning tea adjournment now. Yes, uh, we'll resume, um, I think, at uh, 11.25 yes. uh, at a lap time. Is that convenient? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes. Thank Go you on. very much. Please, please have a break and we'll resume at 11.25. The Royal Commission. And The Royal Commission is resumed. <clears throat> yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Before we start um, on life after leaving N Street, Commissioner McEwen, you have a question that you want to ask arising out of paragraph 71 in relation to the police investigation. Yep, thank you, Ms Eastman. Ms Rogers, if I can take you back to paragraph 70. Yes. Yeah. where you describe the police sent a specialist communication officer to try to talk to Daniel. Just tell me, what was your observation or experience of that particular interaction? OK, um, that was... They actually came without us knowing they were coming, so they turned up, and I wasn't home at the time. Graham was home with Daniel, um, and he said that the police officer involved attempted to talk to Daniel, but Daniel's um, understanding was very clearly limited and she didn't have any success. And her feedback to the investigating detectives was that Daniel would be unable to, unable to give evidence. And how did you feel about that, um, you and Graham? Look, I felt, I understood that. I knew that Daniel would be unable to give evidence, but... Um, and I think the police kept us informed regularly and it was good. I, I still feel there are answers out there and I still would like <coughs> to know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're never gonna know. Okay. Um, and, and I think the police, the police officer, when he came to tell us that they were closing the investigation, he said to us, every single shift that I've been on, I've done something on Daniel's case. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. All right, so can we pick up from paragraph 79? Sure. After we made the decision for Daniel to move home, Graham went to the house on the Wednesday, the 27th of February, to pick up the rest of Daniel's clothing and his other belongings. Graham told me that he picked up the boxes um, of Daniel belongings and that staff had packaged for him to bring home. When I unpacked the boxes, I discovered there were no jumpers, um, no coats or t-shirts, and only three polo shirts. I knew that Daniel had several jumpers and coats, <coughs> and I'd given him three new t-shirts the week previously when he'd been home, when he'd come home dirty. I also thought that he would have had at least 15 t-shirts and 20 polo shirts um, at the house. A lot of the clothing had been packed, um, that had been packed was either bleach damaged or dirty, and many of the items belonged to the other men who lived there. I also know that there were at least two coats in that house that belonged to Graham, because when Daniel had come home cold, um, he'd been sent home with Graham's coats on, so they had disappeared too. Um, staff had also packed a large box of dirty and broken shoes, which contained a pair of ladies' thongs. Um, I don't and know. You've got some photos. Do you want to I'm show happy those for photos? To, I'm happy right. for them to be okay. up if you... So, Commissioners, these are behind tab 17 and tab 18. Mm. And 19, I think. So this is a collection of shoes. There were actually about two boxes and I don't think there was one good pair of shoes in them. They were all filthy and broken. Had you seen Daniel wear any of these shoes? <sighs> Probably not. And some of them were um, obviously, Daniel has a size 13 male foot 
and some of them were like size seven and eight. Okay. All right, so uh, back to paragraph 81. Yes, so given the incident with the quilt earlier, only a few months previous, I had asked Graham to ensure that he brought that quilt home um, that had been purchased in October. Graham told the staff, um, told me that staff were unable to find the quilt. Then after some time searching the house, they came out saying that it had been located. When Graham returned, he gave me the quilt which the support workers had provided. I looked at the quilt and later the tag on the quilt um, and it appeared, it appeared to have the initials of another person. And I don't think we need that photo. No, I won't. Uh, you've no. given the uh, copy of the photo to the Royal Commissioners as part of your evidence, but we don't need to put that no, on the screen. No. Um, I, d I believe they had adjusted the, um, the name tag on it and changed it. Even it, They even used a different colour pen, so it wasn't even very smart changing of the name on the quilt. So... Um, so 83, I think we're up to. Yeah. Uh, we returned all of the clothing and bedding to DHS that didn't belong to Daniel. A lot of the bedding um, was for single beds and Daniel actually had a double bed. So we returned all of that. Uh, staff had forgotten on that day to pack Daniel's medication and I was also aware of the fact that Daniel had some cash at the house from his weekly allowance. But this money was not packed for him either. Graham then had to return that day to collect Daniel's cash and his, um, and his medication. Obviously, he couldn't go without the medication. Um, I complained about the quilt, the dirty clothing and the broken shoes to Wayne. DHS then transferred $500 to us, um, which I was told was to reimburse for the clothing and the shoes. Uh, DHS continued to administer Daniel's finance for a year after he moved out. We'd asked them to do that. Um, but from, and from rec uh, recollection, the $500 from DHS was transferred into our account so we could purchase new clothing for Daniel. We did so and we kept receipts for all of our purchases and we paid out more than $1,000 to replace the clothing that he needed. From February 2019, DHS transferred $400 to us on a fortnightly basis, which I understood was um, drawn from Daniel's pension. That was about half of the amount that he previously used to pay for his board and lodgings. I nominated the amount that, um, and then we paid for all of Daniel's needs from that, from his clothing, medication, everything. Can I just pause in there? Uh, after DHS administering Daniel's finances for a year or so, did you then make arrangements that you became the nominee in terms of managing any finances? No. Um, in fact, Daniel had some funding in, um, in trust for him, um, quite a large amount of money, and I requested that... It was after a year, and so we took over Daniel's finances. I went to Centrelink set up a separate account and Centrelink were more than happy to transfer that to me. But the department were concerned because I didn't have an administration order, but neither did they. Okay. So, um, and I didn't want to have to go down that path to formalise it because I knew that formalising an administration order is actually taking quite a... There's actually quite a lot of administrivia involved in that sort of a um, process. And then you have to um, provide books to the public trustee every year, and it has to be if you're if you are appointed as a formal administrator, right. and it becomes quite an onerous task. Okay, so now we're going to turn to Daniel's life now. Mr. Eastman, sorry, oh. before we go on to that, may I ask one question about you, the medication that you were just talking about? You've described in your evidence that. You know, they sometimes didn't pack the right medication when you went away on holiday. Uh, they gave you the wrong one. How confident were you that the staff in the house were giving Daniel the medication in the correct way? Can you go describe your observations on that? Sure. Um, they had to sign off on everything. And initially, I wasn't 
that unconfident, but after being given the wrong person's medication by a staff member who'd been there for several months, I actually at one stage um, rang Wayne, who was the service manager, and asked him, was the other person on blood thinners? Maybe they'd given the wrong medication to Daniel. And, um, but no, that wasn't the case. So now, look, I look back and I wonder, um, but I guess, you know, it's, it's again, it's something that you're never going to be able to prove and it's a battle that, you know, I've got no, I've got proof of what happened with Daniel. I've got proof of the bruising. I've got proof of the misappropriation of funds and the fact that the quilt disappeared straight away. Um, so I don't know if that's a... It's probably, at the time, I thought maybe it was something we wanted to look into in case blood thinners were involved and that's what had caused the bruising. But, um, but now, I, I haven't really gone back there. I haven't really thought about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodgers. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. Thank you. So before you start uh, picking up from where you're up to in your statement, I just want to take you to a few things Ms. Kirk Ms. Kirkby says in her statement. So she, in her statement, says she instructed the regional manager to reimburse you and Graham the $500 to cover the cost of the beddings and other items. Yes. And she, she also says this, and tell me if you remember this occurring. She said that she arranged for Daniel, for you and Graham to have counselling to assist you with the events that you had endured. Daniel had counselling with a specialist psychologist who had experience uh, with working with people with intellectual disability who had experienced trauma in their lives. And Daniel had received four sessions and you and Graham received two to three sessions and the sessions were funded by DHS. So do you remember that? Yes, um, we, we did went and so we went to see Muriel Kirkby and said that, you know, we were traumatised and so was Daniel. We took Daniel to the first session. Uh, during the first session, he became quite animated and was hitting himself in the head a lot and crying a lot. The next day, he actually bit someone. So we felt that bringing that stuff back to him, and we knew that when we talked about that stuff in the house, that he did become distressed. So we decided not to pursue that. Graham and I had a session with the, um, so uh, in response to that, Daniel had one session mm -hmm. and we just decided that it wasn't appropriate for him. Graham and I also had one session with, their, um, with the DHS counsellor and that was really helpful to us. We actually looked at um, the different ways that we were handling it and because I was handling it on a very emotional level and Graham was handling it on a very practical level and um, that we only, we were going to have a second session but when we came out to the reception area there was about 12 people lined up waiting to make the next appointments and we said no nah, we're not going to wait here in line you know we were quite emotional at the time but then after we left there we felt, we discussed it and we felt that that session had really helped us greatly and so we were able to Move on. So we had, we did have. Um, that's true. The sessions were offered to us and were funded, but we only had one session each. Right. But that was our choice. Okay. And then Miss um, Kirkby also says that she regularly called and met with you to see how Daniel was doing, and this would be approximately weekly. And she says, I'm aware that the regional manager called you weekly to ensure that you had support and to ensure Daniel had a smooth transition to living with you and Graham. And she says, and to ensure Graham, Karen and Graham were supported during this transition, DHS support staff were deployed to Karen and Graham's home every weekend at their request until Daniel had new NDIS arrangements in place for staffing. And we're going to deal with the NDIS arrangements soon. Um, so do you, do you have a recollection of talking to Ms Kirkby on a weekly basis? Um, I have a recollection of talking regularly to Ms Kirkby and of Sandra um, Wallace mm -hmm. ringing at least weekly just to see how we were going. Um, 
and those, those phone calls were very regular. And I often met with Muriel just um, for different reasons, but we always talked about Daniel and she was always very supportive. Okay. And what about deploying a support worker, so a DHS support staff were deployed. Yep. Uh, we, what happened in relation to that? So that was every weekend and yes. what happened? Um, the first time, the first weekend, the, that was a couple of weeks after Daniel came home and the worker who was the initial worker who made the phone call to me on the night about the bruising, um, he attended our home he came and he took Daniel out. He took Daniel to the Cleland Wildlife Park and they had a lovely day out And because Daniel did particularly like this worker. And um, they, when he, but it, it only occurred once because when the worker went back to the house, the other staff gave him such a hard time, um, they accused him of... Um, being too friendly with us and they um, they basically said, you know, that he was a bit of a turncoat and that he shouldn't be supporting us and it just became incredibly difficult for him. He was bullied beyond belief um, from what he... That's what he told you. That's what you he don't, told You me. don't know yourself, but no, that's what I wasn't you were there, told. No, I was I have been... And I've been told by other people that he was and I do realise that... Um, you know, he didn't. Anyway, he came once and he didn't come back again. Now, um, you remember I asked you just before we had the break about paragraph 78 of your statement, which is the follow-up of the IMU meeting? Yes. And the meeting that you referred to there, to your recollection, is the one that occurred on the 8th of July with That's Ms correct. Boswell. That's Yes, I do remember that meeting because it yep. was the day after my birthday, so I do know that okay. that was the right date. Yeah. So, Ms Kirkby also says in her statement that she met with you and Graham on the 25th of February 2019, so that's much, that's the year before, and she said she met again with you, with Lynn Young, Stuart Dodd and Joe Young on the 7th of March 2019 to discuss the investigation process as the matter had been referred to both IMU and the South Australian Police for Investigation. So I just want to make sure that I've sure. covered yes. the sequence of yes, events. That's, and that's Ms. correct. Kirk, and then do you have a recollection of that meeting? I as actually well? do. It's not. Well, there's two meetings there. Yes. So there were two meetings, but but after that one, Stuart Dodd was going to get back to us with the results of theirs, but we didn't hear back from him, which was the result of the meeting on the 8th of July that we requested. And so, in terms of the questions that I asked you earlier about being involved or consulted on the DHS investigation, those meetings didn't elaborate on the policies, processes or systems oh, no. for the investigation? No. Okay. No. Um, the only thing that I can say that would have been said at the first meeting would have been that um, they weren't going to start investigating until the police Yes. investigation had been completed. All right, so I just yep. wanted just to draw your attention sure. to that part yes. of Ms Kirkby's yep. evidence. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and she's giving some evidence later this afternoon, yes. so we'll ask her about that as well. Okay. So can I take you back now to your statement, and I think we're up to paragraph 88. 88, okay. Um, so during the first few weeks after Daniel moved home in February 2019, he didn't settle at night, and he often shouted and hit the walls during the night. After a period of settling in, Daniel has been very happy. He's now talking and eating a lot more. Um, he's come so far in the last two years. For example, three years ago, a staff member told me they'd cancelled Daniel's dent dental appointment because he refused to walk up the stairs at the dental clinic. In March this year, after several familiarisation visits to the specialist dental clinic in Adelaide, Daniel sat in the dentist's chair and allowed her to scrape, use a build-up calculus of his teeth. Now, I know you didn't want me to pause you there, but I'm going to. It's OK. Uh, when you talked about familiarisation visits, can you just explain that to the Royal Commissioners? And the Royal Commissioners, I've heard a little bit uh, about the experience of people with intellectual disability visiting dentists. Yes. And sometimes the, the struggle to even get through the door. So what, what happened in terms of March this year with the familiarisation visits 
and is the specialist dental clinic in Adelaide a specialist service for people with intellectual disability? Don't need to be long. No, just that's help okay. Us I believe it's a specialist service for people with disability. Um, Daniel had Daniel started going there after us bringing him home. We made appointments for him to go there, um, and they have um, the familiarisation visits have been just for him getting in there, sitting in the chair, opening his mouth. And pre-COVID, we went probably two or three times, then everything stopped. Mm. But after COVID, they were bringing him in every three to four weeks just to get him used to things. Um, they actually used the drill on his thumbnail to, so that he understood what was going to happen. And um, he has proved to be a really lovely patient. He doesn't he can't tolerate a lot for a long period of time, but he will sit in the dentist chair, open his mouth, and actually allow them to do some work on his teeth. Okay, all right, let's go to paragraph 90. Yep. Okay. Um, our lives have changed significantly since Daniel came home to live with Graham and me. Despite still being young, and I think 60 is still relatively young, um, I had to retire and give up my career to look after Daniel at home. I now have no income. Graham and I had to move out of the master bedroom to renovate it for Daniel, as well as replacing all the carpets in our home with vinyl slats. We've also installed roller shutters on the doors and windows for noise control, because Daniel can sometimes be very noisy and sometimes at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, we replaced our hot water service with a unit that we can moderate the temperature from inside the house so Daniel doesn't burn himself, because he will play with the taps. Um, we've also installed new swimming pool fencing and we remortgaged the house to pay for a lot of that. So Daniel did help out with some of the roller shutters and um, now Daniel has nighttime incontinence and sometimes he will manage to saturate his sheets in winter as it is now, two quilts, two pillows, a Kylie mattress protector and sometimes this will happen twice a night which can put which may, can mean that we will put eight loads of washing through our front loader washing machine a day. Our water and electricity bills have increased markedly, as did our gas and grocery bills. We installed solar panels, so that's helped. Um, Graham was initially driving over a thousand kilometres a fortnight and 40 hours a fortnight to drive Daniel to the pickup point from his day options, but we have renegotiated that, and that's. Um, Daniel still reacts negatively to anything associated with N Street. Hearing the words um, or phrases like what's wrong or what's the matter or naughty make him very upset. If I say that was naughty, he becomes really, really upset. Uh, he still refuses to go anywhere near the place. Um, at one stage, we were driving on a visit from to Daniel's grandparents and he felt like a cake. He said he wanted a cake. So we knew there was a 24 ba four hour bakery and we turned down the road that went past N Street. As soon as we turned into that road, Daniel became very upset and started saying, don't want it, and repeatedly hit himself in the head. Um, we realised that even though we were happy to have Daniel home, and he was very happy to be home. We needed more help through the NDIS. Um, Daniel became an NDIS participant when he was living in N Street, but the assistance provided through his plan at that time was limited because his accommodation services were provided by DHS in kind. While the NDIS plan provided for Daniel's day options, it did not provide for any additional support before or after day options, respite care on the weekend. So um, there were also modifications that we needed to make to our home so to make sure Daniel was safe. We therefore needed an NDIS plan review. In March 2019, I contacted the NDIA and requested a change of circumstance meeting. It took several weeks to organise the planning meeting. Ms Rogers, can I just slow down just Sorry. a little bit? Okay. Thank you. Um, it took several weeks to organise the planning meeting, and in the interim period, we had no NDIS support for Daniel apart from day options. In late April 2019, 
Daniel's plan was approved. This provided for Daniel to continue attending his day options, as well as some funding for respite. It also provided funding to get assessments done that would provide further evidence um, of the extent of Daniel's support needs. Without funding for support during the week, home modifications and additional respite, Daniel's NDIS plan still wasn't really enough to meet his needs. We needed to go through the process of pr proving that, um, what Daniel's needs were. This process required that I provide up-to-date reports that provided evidence of Daniel's support needs, which meant making appointments for psychometric assessments, an occupational therapy assessment, a sensory assessment, a behavioural assessment and a positive behaviour support plan. It all took months. It was like having to prove that Daniel had a disability all over again. During that time, the psychologist who was completing an assessment for Daniel went to the DHS to review Daniel's files to get more information about Daniel's supports in the accommodation setting. It was the psychologist's review of these notes that we discovered Daniel had been diagnosed with movement disorder and hypertriglyceridemia. We were not aware of either of these diagnoses. Um, and and there is a document from the psychologist. And I don't think commissioners um, will have a copy of that document in the hearing bundle, but I don't need to take you to that document. In about August 2019, we gathered the evidence we needed to lodge a request for, a form for an internal review of Daniel's NDIS plan, as I did not feel Daniel's plan was adequate. I was sent a review application form, and I decided to make an appointment with a support coordinator to help me complete the form. I do not remember the date, but just over a week after I received the form and before I'd met with the support coordinator, I received a phone call from someone from the NDIA who told me I needed to send the reports and the form back within an hour. I was extremely upset because I was on my way to a meeting and I was not going to be able to get that paperwork in within an hour. I explained I wanted to complete the form with the support coordinator and she agreed to give me until the end of the day to submit the reports gathered and 48 hours to complete the form. I met with the support coordinator and completed the documentation. I can't remember what date that was. Ultimately, Daniel's support coordinator sent the review application to the NDIA on the 10th of September. On the 10th of October, I hadn't heard back from the NDA, so I sent another email asking where the review was up to. On the evening of the 11th of October, I received a phone call from a delegate with the review team. The delegate informed me that the review was not going to be granted because we needed to have lodged the application within 90 days of the date of the plan, the date the plan was signed. I explained that it had taken longer than that to get the evidence the NDIA required to consider more assistance for Daniel. She stated there was nothing that could be done as it was legislated. Um, she did say that the assessments that we had done are so good that when Daniel's review comes up in April 2020, Daniel should receive a much better package. On the 17th of October 2019, we received a letter from the NDIA stating because the review of our application had taken longer than 40, 14 days, there would be an internal review of the discussion not to grant a review. Decision? Oh, sorry, decision not to review, not to grant a review of Daniel's plan. I searched the NDIS website to di and discovered a letter can be sent to the Chief Executive Officer of the NDIA to request an internal review of the decision. I wrote to Martin Hoffman on the 1st of November asking for his help. All right, and you've um, provided a copy of this letter uh -huh. and commissioners will find that behind tab 22 in the bundle. And uh, I, I like the, the letter is two pages and I don't think we need to put the entirety of the letter up on the screen, uh, but I'd like you to just 
allow the commissioners and those following this proceeding to get a sense of what your state of mind was. Oh, I've got that. I've now got that on the screen. Yeah. That's helpful. What your state of mind was when you decided to write to Mr Hoffman, the Chief Executive Officer of the NDIS on the 1st of November 2019. Yeah. So I don't need you to read the whole of the letter, but, um, just but perhaps first. just those first few paragraphs may give us yep. a sense of uh, how you were feeling at that time and uh, your sense of frustration. Yes. Um, I wrote to Mr Hoffman and I sent it just after he started at the NDIS. And the second paragraph is, in my life, I dealt with being told I was a young mother and there was nothing wrong with my child for four years. Then to be told my child was epileptic, retarded and would never be okay. I went through a broken marriage and then I had to face the guilt of not being able to provide the care that Daniel needed when he became too big for me to handle. I've always been involved and had, had Daniel at home a minimum of one day a week and earlier this year, Daniel faced the trauma of being hurt in care. No one knows how, but he was badly injured. We've been expressing concerns about his care for the last few years, but this was major. We made the decision to bring him home and he, as he was unhappy and fearful. My life has been busy, hectic, and on occasions quite traumatic. This all pales into insignificance when trying to deal with the NDIS. And I work in the sector. And so you go on to you describe what you had um, taken on in terms of the supports for Daniel on his return home. And, and then just at the end of the letter, you say, I am asking you to, and then in capital letters, please help us, question mark, question mark. All yes. right, so you remember sending that email to Mr. Hoffman by around the 1st of November, 2019, is that right? Yes, um, that may, um, that was the date that I wrote the letter, but I sent it after he, um, I'm not sure what date he started, but I sent the letter after he started with the NDIS. Was it your expectation that he personally would read the well, letter? Well, I would have thought that he would have. Right. And I've written to him since then too. Okay. Okay. You, did, you didn't receive a response? In I never received a response from that. I did okay. get a phone call saying that Daniel had plenty of funding and that we weren't using it all. And I said, as I said to her, you know, um, we don't know what we're going to need because this is fairly new for us. But also, I didn't, I didn't like the fact that, um, that I was given an hour to get the paperwork in and then had to wait for a month for a reply to it. Okay. All right, let's pick, pick things back up at paragraph 103. 103. Um, in December 2019, an occupational therapist came to our home and conducted an assessment of Daniel's ensuite bathroom. They determined that the existing setup of Daniel's bathroom was not safe and made several recommendations, including the removal of the glass <coughs> shower screen, installing of an accessible toilet and basin, and the replacement of existing tiles with slip resistant flooring. The occupational therapist prepared a report um, about the, uh, setting out the recommendations, which the the report was completed on February twenty on the twenty fifth of February twenty twenty. And you've provided a copy of the report and the quote. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, the quote provided by the contractor for the modifications was $19,325.27. For these modifications to be funded through the NDIS, I needed to complete an assistive technology request, which I signed on the 5th of May, 2020. Daniel's support coordinator submit, submitted this request to the NDIS, and the document and you've got a copy there. is there. Um, this was around the time that the scheduled review for Daniel was about to take place. I received a phone call from the NDIS planner who had met with us via phone for Daniel's planning meeting, which we had also discussed the assistive technology request. She congratulated us, stating that Daniel's plan had been approved. 
She went through what had been approved and asked about the bathroom, the home modifications. She stated that that request had been declined. I was extremely upset and said I would be requesting a review. Daniel's support coordinator, coordinator made three separate requests to the NDIS over a period of a month for written reasons why the decision of the um, assistive technology request. Um, so the decision to decline, to the, decline AT request. the AT request, which were eventually provided to Daniel's support coordinator. And you've given us a copy of that document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we applied for a review of the decision and we were advised that the review had been declined. I was advised by Daniel's support coordinator that we had 28 days from the date of the internal review decision to submit an application for an appeal through the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Did you know what the Administrative Appeals Tribunal well, was? Well, I did know, mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't had any experience with them. So we engaged a lawyer to assist us and to submit the application and to represent Daniel at AAT. The application was submitted on the 6th of August and that application is enclosed. After submitting the application, a case conference was arranged which was attended by our lawyer. Case at the case conference, an agreement was reached that the NDIS would fund the modifications to Daniel's bathroom to the value that was previously mentioned. The AAT ordered that the modifications be funded through NDIS. And, and you've included a copy of the, yes. green, the orders, yes. Daniel now has a good plan covering his requirements, although the plan is significantly less than what it would be should Daniel live in supported accommodation. We found the NDIS process extremely difficult to navigate. It seemed that uh, if we didn't meet a deadline, then Daniel would be denied support. But if they did so, it just added more layers of bu bureaucracy for us to complete. This is particularly concerning because I work in the disability sector, so I had a better than average understanding of the terminology and the process, and it was still almost impossible for us to navigate. All right, so pausing there, um, you've told the Royal Commission uh, some of your experiences in navigating the NDIS. And you've got a concern this is going to be ongoing for Daniel's life. All right, but I want you now to turn to the final part of your statement, which is your reflections on your experiences. So you start this at paragraph 112. Mm -hmm. The past two years have been incredibly difficult and traumatic time for all of Daniel's family. We love Daniel dearly and we have supported him through this time to the best of our ability. It's been distressing at times, not knowing how to help him, as we were never able to understand the trauma that he had been through. We have, as a family, attempted to give him support and confidence through the night terrors. We also assure him regularly that he will be staying with us. Having to deal with the bureaucratic expectations and jump through the flaming hoops of the NDIS has been a torturous experience, taking many hours and causing enormous stress to my husband and myself. Families play a vital role in the lives of their loved ones with disabilities. They have history, understanding, knowledge and commitment, and this needs to be recognised. Agencies and staff should work with families and make every effort to keep them informed and involved. If a support worker wins lotto, they will probably not continue in the lives of the client they're supporting. If I win lotto tomorrow, no matter where Daniel is, I will be there, bringing with me the invaluable knowledge. One of the things that uh, happened, and I'll just jump in here, when Daniel was quite young and he'd cut himself and people were trying to hold him down to give him a needle to anaesthetise him, and he actually arrested. So he was only about 18 at the time, and I was with him, and it was very traumatic. So that's why I insist on him giving, having the midazolam before he actually goes through any procedures. But um, it was a very traumatic time. But when you look at Daniel's um, 
Daniel's notes, there's nothing in that. That's all been previously archived, you know, because it happened 20 years ago. But I know what will happen. If I'm there, I insist, but, you know, if I'm not there and if it's just support workers and they take him to hospital, they're going to try and hold him down to give him a needle. And it could happen again. He could arrest again. And so I've got that knowledge of what's happened in the, in the history. I know how many vials of midazolam he needs. I know how to hold him. I know, and this sounds really corny, but the security guards actually told me on the night of this, one of the security guards came back and asked how Daniel was going. Mm -hmm. And he'd been holding one of Daniel's legs for the period of trying to get the needle in. And he said to me, do you know, he said he was so tense and so strong when I was holding his legs, but when you were holding his head and singing to him, I felt him relax. And no support worker's going to do that for Daniel. No support So I just, I really reiterate that families are so important. Families have so much knowledge and they, they need to be encouraged to keep involved, not sort of pushed away and like get out of our way and let us do our job. Okay. So, okay. So I want to talk about staff and when staff working with people with disabilities, they need proper training. They need proper support and they need proper supervision. They need regular meetings, including staff meetings at sites, and they should be mandatory. It's important that all staff have the same information and the same discussions about medication, circumstances, changes in routines. Staff also need to learn to listen to families. This should be included in every bit of training that they receive. People with disabilities and their families should be involved in interviewing staff. When Daniel first went into care in the early days at Haywood Avenue, there was a pilot project which trained families of people living in IDSC accommodation to interview staff professionally. I was involved in that training and for many years I was involved in interviewing staff. Staff who worked with Daniel, but not just as his house, for other roles such as case managers and therapists. I also want to talk about the Community Visitors Scheme. The South Australian Community Visitors Scheme needs to be strengthened and funded appropriately. And I identify here that at the moment I am um, I'm on hold as a community visit because I see this as a bit of a conflict of interest, me being involved in this. But um, I think visitors need to do reg regular scheduled and unscheduled visits to all accommodation services and not just the government services, the NGOs as well. The program should be expanded to include day options and people living in their home, own homes, particularly people deemed as vulnerable. We would welcome a community visitor into our house to see what we're doing, to see, make sure that we... I wanted to, to ask you that. You, were you here when um, Mr Brogerman gave some evidence yesterday about the community visitor scheme? Yes. Yeah. He was asked about uh, an opt-in uh, option for people mm. who live in their family homes or live by yes. themselves. Yes, and that was identified mm. by the Anne Marie Smith task. Yeah. And what, what would what would your view be about community visitors coming into your home? Absolutely, I would welcome community visitors into my home, and I think that visitors need to um, people who are vulnerable need to be identified. I mean, Daniel's vulnerable. He has us, I'm his mum, he has his stepdad, Graham, and he has, um, he has his twin brothers and his sister and that extended family. But we're his family. He doesn't really have anyone else. So I'm no, he's welcome. Not, yeah, he's not going to a day program at the moment. No, um, we actually chose to take him out of day program. And you haven't sought to find some employment for him as an artist? Um, or a well, singer? That's, or... Certainly, that's certainly on mm. the cards mm. um, because you may, you've may you seen that today I gave you a coaster that Daniel has made. Yes, and um, you know, it is something that we would like to encourage in the future, but right now we I have basically written a day program for him which includes a picnic day, it includes a day. Mm. Everything is out in the community though, where he is visible, where um, people see him on a daily basis. He goes to a gym once a week. And so those people in the gym know him. And you know, he goes in the pool in the gym. 
So he would be in fairly, you know... Um, I think he's got a strong view about whether you go in the pool with him has. as well, does he I not? <laughs> so, I have to say, and this is probably deviating a little bit, but I took Daniel to the pool the other day and he has one support worker that goes with him every now and then and I do um, the rest of it. And the other support worker, Joe, who he really likes, goes in the pool with him and the, um, and the exercise physiologist. But last week I said to him, Daniel, Mum, come in the pool or Mum, stay out? And he said, Mum, stay out. And I thought, well, I'm at the pool now and I've got my bathers on, so, you know. And he went to walk down the steps and he, I went to walk in after him and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, Mum, stay out. And I'm so proud of him that he can make a decision and he can actually say that that's what he wants. I, was, I mean, I was a bit annoyed that he didn't want me in there, but I was so proud of him for making that decision. And, and in that sense, and I know we're talking about community visitors here, but that sense of ensuring that Daniel has that involvement with a broader community, yep. so not just with you and Graham, but that he's got people around him. He's got the exercise physiologist on the Friday after he goes there. There's a cafe near there that we always take him to and um, they all say, hi, Daniel, when he comes in, they all know him. So I believe that, you know, he's being seen by an exercise physiologist in his bathers, and so if there was anything inappropriate, I'm pretty sure the exercise physiologist would identify it. Um, and I think, you know, so for me, the farm where he went was really good for a period of time, but now he needs to be, that's a very segregated setting so he needs to be in the community more and he needs to be very visible in the community. The people at Cleland Wildlife Park, which is in the Adelaide Hills, they know him. He can go to Cleland and they know what he likes for his lunch. So he can walk up to the Cleland Wildlife Park counter with his card, with his debit card, and they say to him, would you like chips, Daniel? And he says, yes, please and he can pay for them with his card. So part of it, I said, you, you wanted to tell the Royal Commission about just Sorry. building that independence for, for Daniel and your hope for him in the future is to have a life in the community where he can be independent and have choice and control, is that right? Yes, and we've made, we are making, we're in the process of making provisions that our home at North Haven, he will stay in even after Graham, if Graham and I become too old or can't look after him anymore, the other children are all very happy for this, that Daniel will stay in this house, but it will be done properly and it will be legally done so that he has, he can stay in that house until the day he dies. Right, now I've diverted you off community visitors. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, that you wanted to express your views about the community visitor scheme and you say at the end of paragraph 117, principal community visitor role needs to be permanently filled as a matter of urgency. So you've got a strong view about that, I is that right? I do a strong view about that and the principal community visitor scheme, the principal community visitor role was filled on Friday, was appointed on Friday. That principal community visitor is also the... Um, the public advocate, so... Right, and there was some um, news release over the weekend about having a system of apps, and obviously that uh, is news that <laughs> postdates your statement, but you read that article in the Sunday Mail on Sunday, so a yes. couple of days ago, yep. about an app system, and based on your experience with Daniel and your experience in the sector, How's the app going to the app. work or what do you think might be the experience of people with disability using the app? Well, you saw me shortly after I had seen about the app and I was angered. I was, um, I mean, there's, the government has put in half a million dollars towards developing this app that people in their homes, a visitor can visit them through an app. Daniel has no concept of an app. He has no concept. He's, he's um, understanding of my phone is that it's something he can watch Sale of the Century and Scooby-Doo on. He, um, he has no comprehension of an app and I would be concerned for people in supported accommodation who were given an app who, had, um, who were not able to use that app by themselves. 
and they were given an app, they'd have a staff member with them. So what opportunity does that um, provide for them to give honest feedback? And if they can even use an app, if they're even verbal. So at this stage, what you know about the app is what you read in the newspaper. Yes. So uh, we may ask some questions during the course of the week Absolutely. about that. Yes. Right, the final topic you wanted to raise was security cameras. And this uh, you wanted to raise because of not getting any sort of clear answer in terms of how Daniel might have sustained the injury and the very large bruising. Yep. And um, what would you like to tell the Royal Commission about the security cameras? You've set that out at paragraph 118. Yes. Yeah. Commissioners, um, this is the final this topic is my final um, paragraph. that, that yes. Ms Rogers wants to cover and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, hand back to the Commissioners yep. if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, when I first became involved in the disability sector, there were many discussions about dignity of risk versus duty of care. But now I just see this as dignity versus safety. If it, um, if it is between people seeing Daniel naked or seeing Daniel being safe in these places and places being accountable, there is no choice. Cameras should be introduced, particularly in common areas, However, if there is concern identified, there should be an option to place cameras in the private areas such as bedrooms, if there is concerns identified. And I think that should be done like um, with full discussions with families or the person with the disability, if they are able to agree to that. But if families have concerns about what's happening with their child or their son or their daughter or their sister or brother or niece or nephew, um, there should be an option that something can be, you know, there must be some way of recording if there is, if there are concerns about someone's safety. Um, Thank you, Ms Rogers. Chair, I understand that none of the parties with leave have any questions of Ms Rogers, so it, it, the commissioners may have some questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Ms Rogers, I'll just ask uh, first uh, Commissioner Bennett whether she has any questions to put to you. Um, firstly, thank you very much for coming today and telling us um, what's happened to Daniel um, and the impact that it's had on Daniel and you. In relation to the security camera issue, um, wouldn't it be better that the systems that are, are that nature of where people live, um, the, that the um, skills and um, aptitude, the culture and the governance were the, the protections and things like community visitors, wouldn't, wouldn't that remove any debate about needing, if, if we can get those things right? Absolutely, but they're not right at the moment. The, um, as Mitchell's family said yesterday, in some of these places, the um, atmosphere is toxic and people are not, people are not safe at the moment. Um, so, you know, I mean, ideally what you're saying would be ideal. I wouldn't want to have a camera watching me, you know, but if, um, like, if, as in aged care set settings, some people are putting hidden cameras in and they're finding things that they don't want to see, but they're finding them. And, um, I mean, it's clear that not everyone is safe in accommodation services. If what you're saying, if or everything was... Um, if everyone was accountable and things were happy and people were happy and... Um, the community visitors could go in as they, as they do in other states. In South Australia, we, our South Australian government, doesn't allow them to go into non-government organisations, um, although those, that has been um, uh, amended in other states. But we, um, if those things were all in place and um, managers were you know, accountable and senior managers knew what was going on in the services. Absolutely, I absolutely 100% agree with you. It would be far better if we didn't have to do that. So that should be our aim. Absolutely. Rather than institutional settings that become more institutional oh, by having I, cameras. Yeah, and I agree. Things. And okay. I 
can guarantee you that Daniel will never go into another institutional setting because group homes are many institutions, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, I mean, when he went there, we were in a difficult situation and I don't know what we would do had we our time over again. I think I probably would have done it differently, having the knowledge that I have now. But at the time, we were limited as to what was available to us. Um, and, you know, I mean, our ultimate goal should be that people are safe. I have one last question, Chair, sure. if, if it's... Um, you said that Daniel um, went into a, a residential living arrangement when he was about 11, when yes. you were um, expecting your twins. Had Daniel participated in school during that time, and was that continued when he left living with you? Yes, yes, he had been in school. Um, he was regularly suspended from school because he was a bit of a terror. Um, and, um, but no, yes, that did continue once he went into accommodation services, yes. And how long did he continue education for? Until he was 18. Um, he wasn't, I mean, it wasn't what I would call a great education. Um, as I said, he was regularly suspended, and um, but he he did continue attending school, should we say. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner McEwen, do you have a question? Uh, no, thank you. Other than to say, thank you very much, Ms. Rogers, for coming today. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rogers, just to follow up what Commissioner Bennett asked, what, what kind of school was it? We don't need to know the name, but what kind of school? He did attend a special school. Um, I think that uh, even now in this day and age, I think he would struggle to attend a mainstream school. He wasn't toilet trained until he was um, quite a lot, well, into his teens. And um, for want of a better word, he was into natural art. He did a bit of artwork with his, um, with his bodily functions and that would not go down well in a classroom. He also regularly bit people. Um, and it's only in the last few, it's only since Daniel came home that, and I've been involved in more recent times in the um, incident reports and the problems when Daniel has bitten that I've worked out, I've actually worked out why he bites. And he bites because people are screaming around him. And I'm, I'm not sure if, um, and I don't want to be flippant, it sounds a bit flippant, but I'm not sure if he, um, if he thinks that um, the noise bothers him or if he thinks I'll give you something to scream about. So <laughs> he's, um, he's a bit of a terror. And, and as I said, he still bites. But, um, you know, I'm very thankful to say that he doesn't bite me anymore. And the special school you refer to is one run by the state, is it? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming to the Commission to give your um, evidence. Uh, in particular, thank you for preparing that uh, video, which uh, we have seen earlier today. And uh, that video reflects uh, fairly obviously the love and caring you have for Daniel. And we're grateful for you being prepared to do that for the Commission and for people who are following our work. And also I want to say thank you for how clear and thoughtful and fair your evidence has been. We thank you for that. We appreciate your contribution to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Chair, that concludes Ms Rogers' evidence. We thought if it was convenient to the Commissioners that we have uh, our break for lunch now and then we'll return after lunch. And Ms Elizabeth Bennett, who is in Melbourne and on the video link, will take the witnesses for this afternoon session. So we shall resume then at 1.30 Adelaide time. I'll just double check with those instructing me. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's fine, thank you. 1.30. We'll resume, we'll resume at 1.30, thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned.
session is resumed. All right, I think we're, we're chair, we're just waiting to see if we've got sound from you. Yeah. All right. Um, the, the next witness will be Mr Cunningham. Before he gives his evidence, Commissioners, I want to tender some documents into evidence. Yes, thank you, Ms Eastman. Uh, we didn't actually hear that uh, everybody was ready, but now we're on screen, all is well. Yes, right. thank you. Uh, so, Commissioners, there are two uh, documents, or a video and a photograph, but I'll call them documents from Ms Rogers' evidence that it may, may be appropriate to tender into evidence now. The first is the, what I might call, Daniel Rogers' video. You might remember the four-minute video. Could that be tendered and marked Exhibit 14.2? Yes, that, that will be done, thank you. Then there is the photograph, which is in the hearing bundle Part A behind tab 13. And if that photograph could be tendered into evidence for this case study and marked 14.3. Now that's the one, just to be clear about it, the one behind tab 13. Yes, that's right. And that's the only photograph that you wish to tender? For today, as I said earlier, we'll, we'll ask you to make some directions at the end of the hearing about the tender of material generally, but with respect to those two documents that they're tendered now. Yes, thank you. Those two documents then will be admitted into evidence and bear the exhibit numbers to which uh, Ms Eastman has referred. And Commissioners, Mr Cunningham is in the hearing room here in Adelaide and Ms Bennett will take his evidence via the video link. Thank you. Um, Mr Cunningham, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. If you would be so good as to follow the instructions of the associate in the room you were in, yes. uh, then she will administer the affirmation to you. No problem. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cunningham. Uh, now, Ms Bennett who is in Melbourne, actually, will ask you some questions. And just so you're aware of where everybody is, you probably already are, uh, Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner McEwen are in the hearing room in, uh, in, Mel in Adelaide, wherever we are, Adelaide, and I happen to be in Sydney, but no doubt I'm appearing like a brooding omnipresence in the sky on the screen. Yes, Ms Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Cunningham, can you tell the Commissioners your full name? Uh, Wayne Francis Robert Cunningham. Now, Mr Cunningham, you've made two statements for this Royal Commission. The first dated 14 May 2021 and the second dated 24 May 2021. Is that right? I'm sorry. Um, the message was very garbled and I couldn't understand what you said. I'm sorry. I, I understand you've made two statements to this Royal Commission. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. One is dated 14 May 2021 and the other is 24 May 2021, is that, that right? Yes, correct. Sorry, can I just, um, Ms Bennett, your sound is um, not ideal. We're only hearing every second word. It's also breaking up in Sydney a little. I'm very sorry, I've got a technical person present with me in the room who will try to assist. I'll try again. Is that any better, Commissioner? Too soon to tell. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll persist. Um, commissioners, the statements of Mr Cunningham are at tabs one and two of hearing bundle B. Mr Cunningham, have you read those statements recently? Yes, I have. Thank you. And read together, noting that the second corrects some matters in the first. Read together, are you content that those statements are true? Yes, I am. Yes, they're true. Thank you. Um, I, I tend to those statements, Commissioner. Do, um, we need to give, do we need to give them a, an exhibit no, number? Sorry, um, Commissioner. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll deal with the tender of all of the documents uh, 
after the conclusion of the hearing. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Cunningham, you started working in the disability sector in around 1989, is that right? Uh, yes, 1988 actually, um, 4th of March. Thank you. What was your role? Thank you. And what was your role on the 4th of March 1998? Um, after? I, was, I started at Strathmont Centre as a home assistant. Right. And then you worked uh, as a disability services officer between 1995 and 2008, is that right? That's correct. And, and what, what did that role involve, Mr Cunningham? Um, the direct care and support of um, people in institutionalised care. See. And what's your current role? I'm the Playford Area Manager within Accommodation Services. See. And who do you report to? Um, I report to uh, Mr Mark Perry, Assistant Director. See. And who does Mr Perry report to? Um, Mrs Muriel Kirkby, Director, Accommodation Services. Thank you. And without naming people, Mr Cunningham, can you tell me what is the, the job which reports to you uh, in your role? Um, I have two um, team leaders and under them sit um, team supervisors, approximately uh, one, two, Five, six each, and under them sit the um, disability services officers who um, are supported and mentored by the team supervisor. Okay, so is it in a supported accommodation environment, it's the disability support officers who live on site with the people that are being supported? Yes, they um, work in the, in the clients' homes, yes, in the people's homes. I see. And where are the team supervisors located? Um, they were either are based in the, the home, depending on the size of the, the group home, or they're a float supervisor and start and finish their day in a particular group home. But they're, um, the supervisors are out um, in, in the houses every day. Yes. And the team leaders, where are they based? Um, in um, our local office in, at Salisbury. Um, and how often do they visit the houses that they're responsible for? Um, they're required to visit each of their accommodation sites monthly, but I would say visit more frequently than that. All right. Now, I want to take you back until the end of 2018 for a moment. Um, now, we're speaking about one of the houses um, that you were responsible for as N Street. You're aware of the house that I'm talking about when yes, I say I N Street. Right. Yes. Uh, and Ms. Ben Ms. Ben Ms. Bennett, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you've been asking questions of Mr. Cunningham about the current situation yes. in terms of organisation. Are we clear that the same arrangements apply at the time you're now asking? No, I'm, I'm just about, that's right. So in, two, in October 2018 was the structure what we have just discussed. There were disability support officers living in the house, is that right? At the time, yes, there was a, um, accommodations, uh, disability services officers in the group homes, yes. And did they report to team supervisors? Uh, no, they reported to a shift supervisor. Yes. And was that shift supervisor present in the house? No, not in all houses. In, at that time in my area, um, there was only one on-site supervisor. The rest of the, the accommodation sites were supported by a, what we call a float shift supervisor. I see. And what about in street? Did that have a shift supervisor or a float a shift supervisor? A float supervisor. I see. And across how many houses did that supervisor float? Um, mm, four to five. I, I can't um, give you without, without looking at the list, but they had several sites they supported. Um, and that shift supervisor in 2018, the last latter part of 2018 reported to team leaders, is that right? No, reported to an accommodation services manager, which, which I was at that time. I see. And where were the accommodation service managers based at the end of 2018? Um, we were office based, um, as well were the float supervisors. So they would start their day um, and finish their day at our office at 75 Port Road, Cheltenham. And was N Street one of the houses within your portfolio at yes, the end of was. 2018? Yes, yes, it was. And 
how often did you get to end street while you were the accommodation services manager um i would say um semi-regularly i would go there to attend house meetings um i would if there was any care concerns if there was um, a problem that couldn't be resolved at a local level with the supervisor they would then um, involve me and i would attend um what what is it what do you mean by a house meeting um we used to have um quarterly um, teams meetings where we would all the staff would get together um, it wasn't compulsory so um, some meetings were well attended and others weren't so well attended and um, we would generally have them at the house or if there was um, training involved we might have them at the the port road office uh, were those meetings well attended at the end of 2018 at n street do you remember uh no they probably weren't um it was a hard site to have staff attend meetings can you tell the commissioners what, why you think it was a hard site to have people attend meetings? Um, because of the roster. It was um, a roster that had um, active passive night duty. He would work until nine in the morning and um, they would support the 12 hour day person who worked from 7 a.m. to 19.10 or 19.20. And we have an afternoon person who would start at two in the afternoon and work till 10 at night to support the night staff. But their first job was to go and do the day program run. So they would leave at two o'clock and go and do the, um, uh, you know, picking up um, the men from their day options. All right, I just want to unpack that for a moment because where, was there an, a handover period where the night staff would have the opportunity to speak for a moment with the day staff who were taking over? Yes, there was a handover in the morning. So um, the, the, pa the passive night staff would work till, I think it was nine o'clock, 8.30 to nine, I'm pretty sure it was nine o'clock because um, they would get the boys or the men ready for their day programs and the day person would take them. And when they would come back, that's when um, the night staff would leave if there was someone who didn't go to uh, day options. Not everyone went to day options five days a week. So um, quite often there would be someone, so there had to be a staff member at, back at the house. But they had that couple of hours in the morning, seven till nine, where they could have um, handover. And um, the night supervisor would also do a report that would go to the day supervisor. So any issues that were raised by night staff were addressed that way as well. Okay. Um, so was that a formal requirement or was it just a cultural adaptation that those handovers would occur? Um, no, it was a requirement. Every um, accommodation site, we have a handover of um, staff from one section to another. There were certain things that would be required to be undertaken at a handover. So if you had um, DDA drugs that need counting, that, that counting would occur. There was um, handing over of the money in the safe um, and, um, you know, uh, clients' um, health concerns were discussed, the bail management support plans were discussed, so people needed suppositories that day or that evening, that could, that was where things like that occurred. So there was a complete handover. Okay. Um, so what was it about that house that made it difficult to get people together for a quarterly team meeting then? Um, was was the, the roster, so um, the night staff, because they would work um, uh, 1900 to um, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning shift. They wanted to go home, so they didn't want to stay back for a meeting. Um, the part-time staff, we found it hard to get them to come in early. We offered, we would pay them, um, uh, try and incentivise them to attend. Um, but yeah, they, um, they often had appointments themselves during the day. So when we did call a meeting, we had a set dates and we had a calendar of dates and we encouraged people to participate. But um, yeah, it was, um, I, I couldn't force people to attend. I see. And there's no scope for additional support to facilitate those meetings? Um, we would, um, uh, if depending, sometimes we could bring in extra staffing and that's what I would negotiate with my area manager at the time, if that was possible. Sometimes, depending on what needed to be discussing, it was possible. But still then, I, I couldn't get um, full attendance. It was only probably a, probably a couple of meetings 
in the uh, the years I um, oversaw that team that uh, was able to get full attendance. Was that unusual for that house? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Was that unusual when compared with other houses? Uh, no, not really. There was, um, I was just, just thinking about my other accommodation sites that I managed at the time. It was, it was always a struggle to have, because it was two defined sections, section one, section two. So we, we, in our calendar, we would rotate what section the meeting would be held so that everyone, you know, was involved in a meeting at some point. So there was not, it wasn't all on section one. So if section two staff didn't attend, they never um, got to be involved in the meeting, that didn't occur. We would, we would have the meetings rotating, so on both sections. So over the course of a year, hopefully everyone got um, involved in meetings. All right. Um, Mr Cunningham, do you remember if you ever met Daniel at N Street? Yes, I knew Daniel very well. Yes, can you tell us about Daniel? Um, I found him to be a, a lovely man. Um, he reminded me a lot of my nephew, who functionally is very similar to Daniel. So I had a great warmth for him, as did I have for all the, the men who lived in the N Street sites. And um, how was your relationship with his family? Very good. I had a, a good relationship with Karen and um, she could easily talk to me and I found her very easy to talk to. She was very understanding. Um, being a manager, we were both the same classification at that time. Um, her working in CARA as a accommodation manager and me as an accommodation services manager within accommodation services. See. Um, now, did you hear her evidence earlier today? Yes, I did. Yes. Um, you would have heard Karen speak about um, an incident that happened in late 2016 um, where staff didn't properly pack Daniel's clothes and medication for his holiday. Did you hear her speak about that? Yes, I did. Yes. Um, can you tell the Royal Commissioners how you felt about that incident when it happened? I was embarrassed. Um, Karen had met with me and provided a list which was emailed to me. I personally took it out to the, the site and entered it into the diary and it was also placed on the notice board. Um, the shift supervisor was also advised and um, it was yeah, communicated on multiple ways for the staff to um, prepare um, his um, holiday bag and ensure he had his medication, etc. And as I understand your evidence, after um, Ms Rogers made her complaint, you spoke at the House meeting about that issue, is that right? Yes, I spoke at the House meeting and with the individual staff and supervisors involved. And what did you tell them, do you remember? That it was unacceptable, that um, there had to be change, um, that staff had to take responsibility for their actions and ensure um, clients and families were supported, that um, I was very disappointed in, the, in them. All right. Another incident... Oh, that sorry, what, was... what did they tell you? Uh, they, they acknowledged they dropped the ball and um, they were very re remorseful about the situation. The staff involved were experienced staff who genuinely cared for Daniel and um, wanted him to have a successful holiday. And I think everyone at the time, the staff thought each other were doing the work that was required. And um, obviously, no one was doing it. And did you report back to Daniel's family about what you found out about what had happened? Um, yes, I believe I gave feedback around the fact that, um, that there were staff were, I've apologised and the staff were remorseful about that um, happening to Daniel and ruining his holiday. Um, we heard about an incident around the purchase of some bed linen in October 2018. Yes. And um, is that a complaint that also concerned you? Yes, it, yes, it did concern me. Yeah. Can you tell us what, tell the Royal Commissioners what it was that concerned you about that the most? Um, 
the lies told to the family by the staff involved and the fact that um, Daniel was excluded from that process. Um, we promote um, with the clients, uh, staff involved clients in the, the purchase of their life, not a hotel model where everyone just stays to the side and staff do everything. You know, I would expect Daniel to be involved in his life and have an active participation in decision making around his purchases, his items. And is it fair that for this model to work, there needs to be open and transparent communication between the people working in the home and the family? Most definitely, yes. And with Daniel? Yes. Yes. I wanted to understand about um, how Daniel's money was accessed. Do you know, as I understand it, there was cash on the premises belonging to Daniel. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's correct. And it was about just over $250 on premises, is that right? Yeah, there probably would have been a bit more than that. It was approaching his birthday, so the staff would have requested to, through their supervisor extra money from client trust so they could buy um, birthday presents and um, other, uh, other things he needed. So who was responsible within the house for Daniel's money? Um, well, it was a shared responsibility. The, on any given shift, um, the staff on duty were responsible for accounting the money and signing it over. They would need to have conversation with either family or the supervisor or myself. Um, some uh, couple of the men at N Street were under guardianship, under the public advocate, so um, their spending um, would have been delegated to me to monitor on their behalf. So, um, but um, in this case, um, you know, Daniel's family had oversight of that and um, having, um, sh should have been consulted. So you, said that you said, Mr Cunningham, that the staff at N Street in 2016 were experienced and remorseful about what had happened then. Yes. We're now yes. talking about 2018. Yes. Was this the same... Was this the same uh, group of staff members or had no. it changed? No, it had changed. Um, we did um, rotate staff um, and uh, we did move, staff did move. Um, I tried to have stability and, and not move people for a couple of years, but I, I generally would rotate staff, encourage staff to move around the service um, and learning how to support people with different types of disabilities. And also, I did want a culture where staff took ownership. Um, so I did encourage staff um, movement. That was always drummed in me in Strathmont Centre. We were moved um, within the villas and then um, within the villa and then to other villas. So we were, there wasn't that ownership issue and I tried to maintain that. Yes, thank you. So as at late 2018, was anyone identified as the custodian of Daniel's money? Um, it was an informal arrangement with Karen. So uh, money did sit with um, client trust and um, money came down. And if um, staff would, I expect, would expect, would um, have a conversation with Karen and Daniel about purchases, or they might suggest a purchase. And then the staff would then go and take Daniel and, and make that purchase. Um, it, or it could be that um, um, Karen would want some information on um, you know, the balance or something and that could be provided. So how did money get from Daniel's bank account to the house? Um, it was delivered by um, courier um, and um, money would come down for all the clients at once. Then um, it would be counted by admin staff and then um, dispersed to the three teams in Cheltenham and the supervisors would then count that money again before um, staff and the clients attended the office to collect the money where they would sign for it. And were you aware of any limits on the amount of money that could be held on behalf of Daniel at the house? Um, yeah, we did strive to have a limit of um, $250, but that limit would go above that if they were buying for 
um, say like at Christmas time, we would order four weeks money in advance because the client trust would close over Christmas or around you know the public holidays if they had to do, the, I mean, we had a specific day of delivery. So um, if that falled in a week where there was a public holiday, we generally would do a, a double order or a triple order, depending, especially over Christmas, it would be a four week order. Are these informal arrangements common in your experience? Oh yes, yes. So you understand it's reasonably common that where there are no guardianship orders in place, the funds are managed by DHS? Yes, they would be managed at um, a local level um, and there would be um, oversight by the audit team. I see. All right. Um, I wanted to move on to ask you about a little bit later in October of 2018. Um, and I wanted to show you um, a document at Hearing Bundle B, tab 71. Now, this is an incident report from October 2018. And I'd just like it if you could tell the Royal Commissioners what this document is. Okay. Uh, that is a risk man incident report. All right. Now, can you tell me, as at the end of 2018, were risk man reports, um, how were they completed? Were they done via an online form or by telephone? Um, the support staff would um, ring and enter the report that way by telephone to a, an operator. Okay. So the operator would go through all of the fields with the reporter, is that right? Correct, yes. And the reporter would usually be the officer who works with, the, with for example, Daniel? Correct. It'd be, right? um, the, the support worker generally would um, be the one who would um, ring and make the risk man report, yes, that's correct. And now who would see that report once it was entered? Um, it would be the shift supervisor. Uh, depending on the severity, um, myself, um, the area manager, the regional manager, uh, director, up all the way. When you, say depend yeah. when you say depending on the severity, perhaps the operator could show us the second half of that page. Mm -hmm. And a, a bit further down. Which page do you want? Uh, there are several. I'm sorry, it's at the top of the second page in this one. The, the first word there is severity on the left-hand yes. side. Do you see that? Yes, it has insignificant. Now, yes. yes. So who would see a report that has an insignificant rating? From memory, I don't believe it would have gone any higher than an area manager. So myself and my area manager would have received this um, risk man. Okay, and what would you do with it? Um, that would be, um, uh, would ensure that the shift supervisor investigated and completed a remedial action plan as to, um, to fix the problem, depending on what the situation was, or if it was a client injury, to make sure that um, the client involved got the necessary treatment, we would, the supervisor would upload the report from the ambulance, um, any hospital discharge summary, um, statements from staff, etc., would all be added to that document. Now, the severity um, label determines the level of escalation of that report. That's fair, isn't it? Correct, yes. And the person who enters the severity is the person who has most often witnessed the incident or first noticed the incident. Is that right? Correct, yes. Um, did you ever observe any difficulties with reports downplaying an incident? At times, yes, and I, um, it was in my delegation um, to change that severity rating, which I would do. Okay. Can, can, can you give us an example of, of under-reporting that you're aware of? I don't want specifics, but what sort of issues did you observe? Um, oh, um, 
Uh, I well, guess... perhaps I can rephrase that. Did you observe any such issues at N Street in, in 2018? Uh, not for N Street, no. I didn't. They were very good at reporting um, incidences. Um, that was not a, a concern for that site. Um, I guess um, uh, staff conflict would probably be the main one that would be underreported. Um, any client related issues um, were scrutinised, and um, we would um, change that delegate, um, the severity level if required. Especially if but how would you, Mr Cunningham, yes. if the designation of the severity of an incident is the responsibility of the person who was there at the time, assuming there was such a person, yes. how, yeah. would, how would you get a sense of whether that person was deliberately underplaying the significance of an injury? For I, I wouldn't be able to, but I would look at um, the nature of the injury, so if it involved um, and if it involved a physical injury that resulted in um, external medical care being required, like an ambulance being called for an assessment, I would change it to moderate or to severe. So, um, and that would increase the escalation. So like the community nurses would be inf informed, etc. So there was increased um, involvement, more eyes on the incident. But you would need something, as it were, external and objective to change the assessment of the person re responsible for reporting in the first instance. Um, I, I was capable of making that decision. I could look at an incident and my experience told me that severity rating was insufficient. There was no... But your, but your experience wouldn't all... I'm not putting this as a criticism, but your experience wouldn't necessarily allow you to do that? For example, if a worker deliberately downplayed the significance of bruising and chose not to call a doctor precisely because that person wanted to downplay the significance of the incident, it would be pretty difficult for you to determine otherwise. Um, this following staff member, if they had any concerns, would probably do a new risk man. We are, we'd often have multiple risk mans for the one injury. And I think that's where um, that would be made clear. That um, So we would never discourage anyone from making a report. So if someone come in and, and saw a bruise or um, a client looked unwell, they would report it and escalate it. So we never discouraged staff from reporting. It was always encouraged. All right, well, let's, let's look at an example of uh, risk man from February 2019. Yes. Um, I'll ask the operator to bring up uh, a document that I, I think identifies N Street, so perhaps um, discretion might be required. It's at um, Hearing Book B, tab 67, the document ID SAG.0002.0007.2019. Now, this is. Um, from 18 February 2019. Yes. Um, now, you heard some evidence about um, this incident this morning, I think, from yes. Daniel's mother. Yes. Now, you'll note uh, at the summary, it says, staff was showering client when he noticed two bruises on left side of his bottom. Staff went to the previous notes and was an entry from the overnight staff stating of the bruises. Mm -hmm. So do I understand from that that the bruising was noticed the day before or by the last shift? Yes. Not recorded in risk man. Is, is that fair? That's correct, yes. That's a fair statement. Okay. And can you, un can you explain to the commissioners why it wouldn't have been recorded in risk man? Um, no, I can't explain why that staff member um, at the time uh, did not report it appropriately. My memory says that he asked the day staff to do it on his behalf and that's what that employee did. That's my recollection that he um, he got the, as part of his handover, he advised the staff. Okay, um, you'd agree with me though that the notes here suggest that the staff noticed the bruise and then went to the notes. Correct, you yes. agree with that? I understand, yes. yes. And it, you're not able to say whether it happened one way or the other, is that right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, 
I did investigate it at the time, and this, from uh, memory, the staff, the night staff member um, had had asked um, the the day staff to do it on their behalf to submit the the um, risk man form. All right. So, can you explain why it wouldn't have been done at the time? Um, no, I can't. It, it's, it's not common practice, and um, that staff member was spoken about. You see it, you report it. Okay. Um, so, what criteria would it? So, so at first instance, it was not reported on risk men at all. Correct. The next time the bruise was observed, it was categorised as insignificant. Yes. Is that fair? Correct. Yes. Now, can you? You would have then reviewed this report. Is that right? Yes, I did. And what did you do to consider whether or not the insignificant rating was correct or not? I asked the supervisor to investigate and provide me with feedback and um, okay. yeah, to investigate the incident because it was reported as a small bruise. Ask anyone, did you ask anyone to look at the bruise? The supervisor, yes, to investigate okay. it and um, provide me with um, information. And do you know when the supervisor did that? Um, I, I think there's a journal entry attached to this document that's my, I think it was the 20th, I was able yes. to review it. I'm not sure of the date. All right. Um. Ms Bennett, I just want to be clear Please. that uh, I'm following this. Is this a report of the bruising, the more extensive bruising that we saw in a photograph? No. Chair, I'm coming to that one next. All right, this is okay. the day just... before, uh, and perhaps, Mr Cunningham, we can just explain. This is the 18th of February 2019, and I would be grateful for your clarification about this. Mm -hmm. As I understand, there was these bruises observed on the 18th of February, and then perhaps the witness could be shown um, tab 72 at hearing bundle B, which is SAG.0002.0007.2038, which again will have um, the end street identifier. Um, now that, as I understand it, refers to, um, at the summary, if we could go to the summary part, um, it says, staff was giving client a shower, noticed he had a medium size bruise on the right bottom and the colour of the bruise is pink. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, did that incident report make it to you? Um, I, 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 it would have done, yes. It would have, I would have received an email notification. Do you remember if you reviewed it at around the time you received that notification? Um, I want to say, yes, I believe I did. Um, my journal entry, if there's an attachment um, that would confirm, um, I would have made an entry. All right. Um, now, was there any concern for you about a pattern between the 18th of February and now the 21st of February having bruises? Um, it would have raised um, alarm bells and I would have uh, spoken to the supervisor around um, the cause. Um, as I said, you know, we encourage bruising, uh, bruising, sorry, we encourage reporting of bruises or any incidences um, related. So um, my understanding of this incident was um, another staff member noting the bruise and reporting it. All right, now this is ultimately the bruising, as I understand it, that led to the hospital admission. Is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. Now, the commissioners saw photographs of that this morning. Yes. And you've seen photographs of that bruising yes. earlier as well as today. Is that right? Correct, yes. Now, you'll notice in this Riskman report that we're looking at, the severity is again identified as insignificant. Do you see that? Yes, I do, yes. Now, that rating has been there the whole time, as I understand it. It was never changed. Is that right? Um, it, that would be correct, yes. So subsequent review didn't change the, the, the severity rating from insignificant to anything more serious, did it? Um, that would be because it, it, the, the incident escalated very quickly and um, 
uh, I can't explain why I didn't change that report, but it did not change the um, escalation. Yes. So it so, was still escalated. And as I understand, just having now today seen the photographs that you've seen and having seen them in the past, mm. would you say that that was correctly categorised as an insignificant injury? No, I would have categorised as a major. Okay. Can you tell the commissioners um, why it is that a major injury or a major incident was categorised as insignificant? Um, I can't explain the actions of the staff. Um, I, it was inappropriately classified. All right. This and would it be also correct that uh, the details on this form, which state that staff were giving the client a shower and noticed he had a medium-sized yeah. bruise on the right bottom and the colour of the bruise was pink, that that was not an accurate description of the... Uh, extensive bruising that the client had sustained? Yes, in hindsight, yes, it was um, an incorrect reporting. Mm. Now, it's a little hard. It's a little hard inadvertently, isn't it, to describe the bruising uh, that was sustained in the way that is recorded in this document, isn't it? Yes. Could it have been deliberately downplayed? Uh, no, I, well, uh, n nothing um, that came out of the investigation indicated that. Um, the, um, I think it was just um, the bruise came out at d different t times. It started off very small and seemed to have grown. And I think um, staff reported it as they saw it. So I think that's why it's um, changed from one small bruise to um, medium six, um, medium six bruises, or medium. I think it's medium size or medium six bruise it's got here. So I think it's, it did increase in size over time. And then on the Friday when the staff um, called the locum, that's when the full bruise obviously had come out. I don't think there was a deliberate attempt to, to deceive. No. Was that possibility investigated? Um, staff were questioned. Um, uh, at length, every staff member involved was interviewed by myself um, and HR, and um, staff were made to undertake the code of um, uh, ethics training um, after the interview. They were sat down and um, undertake the online training module um, before they could leave. Um, we fully investigated that, and um, the, the HR then compiled all that evidence for um, triage. All right, well, I'd like to really understand how this was categorised as insignificant. So I'd like to take you to tab 87 of the hearing bundle B. And this is a manual. Can you, before we talk about that manual, can you tell me, Mr Cunningham, about how you were trained, who trained you in the use of RiskMan? Um, there was no formal training. Um, I, I do know of this document and... Um, sorry, sorry, we'll just stay with the first question first. Sorry, I, I don't mean to confuse, but... But you say there was no formal training. What informal training did you receive? Um, it would have been um, just work through, walk through the process. Um, would have been um, like a, a dummy incident um, for investigating. Um, I, uh, there was no formal training around um, entering in RISMAN. It was done over the phone. And, but um, as a supervisor and as um, an ASM, I, um, it was on the job learnt, I guess, would be the way to categorise it. And by 2019, were incidents still being reported over the phone or were they now being entered directly? Uh, no, they were still in, um, entered over the phone. I see. Staff so could do, the... supervisors could do one on an um, electronic copy, but um, and some supervisors did do that, um, but most um, support worker staff um, use the phone to make um, their risk man reports. Is there any way to know whether the reports we've been looking at were made over the phone or by direct entry? No, I, I no, but I would, um, knowing the staff, they would have used the phone. Okay. That was the practice at the time in early 2019 at N Street? Yes. All right. 
And did anyone speak to the phone operators about the way in which they took information down? Um, I think over the time there was um, issues with um, uh, communicating um, with English as a second language for some of our staff. I think some of the nuances of words were misinterpreted and um, we would then correct that when um, did the remedial action. If for some, I'm uh, sorry? We would correct it so when we um, reviewed, when the team supervisor, sorry, the shift supervisor reviewed all myself, I might change some of the wording in the document because um, it was incorrect or they used the wrong term to describe um, uh, and the incident. So um, uh, they might have put um, uh, epileptic fit and I would change that to seizure. Now, I'm sorry, what I meant to ask is, was there any investigation of the phone operators in relation to the incident reports that we've been looking at? Oh, sorry, no. Part not, of the not, not, I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I didn't. Can now, I check... Sorry, I'm sorry, Ms Bennett. I just want to check some of the chronology here because there perhaps is some inconsistency or I've misunderstood something. The risk man report we've been looking at states that the incident time was 6 a.m. and that the report is received on the same day, the 21st of February, 2019. In your second statement, paragraph 14a, you say on 20 February, 2019, I reviewed the risk man report generated by a support worker. Now, is that a reference to this or is it a reference to a previous? Incident? It's the previous one dated the 18th of February. Right. You then say on 22 February, this is paragraph 14B, you received an email from a staff member of the residence advising that bruising had been noticed on Daniel when he was prompted from a shower and that a risk man had been submitted by a night staff. Now, is the risk man document we've been looking at one that was submitted by the night staff? Correct, yes. Who was on at six o'clock in the morning or thereabouts? Yes, that would be ABQ. But you don't get to hear about this till the next day, is that right? Yes, I, I, um, depending on, um, uh, received a lot of emails and um, I think with the classification that would show on the email header. So um, I probably, if it had been uh, higher, I probably would have picked it up sooner. Ms Rogers' statement, paragraph 52, says on Friday 22 February 2019 at 5.54pm, she received a phone call from a support worker at End Street informing her that uh, her son had a, a large bruise on his back and that the, the locum was called. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure why this is a reference to the 22nd of February, but were you aware when you got an email as referred to in 14b that a locum had been called? Um, I, at that time, um, wasn't an on-call officer, so uh, if it was out of hours, um, I would not have been notified, no. I see. Until the Monday, I think, is when I was made fully aware. Yes, I see. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so if we could have a look at the document on the screen. That's a risk and incident reporting manual for default level users. Now, am I right in understanding that that captures all users of the risk man system? Yes, all um, like support staff, yes, for everyone. Yes, that's all, correct. Yes. Um, were you showing this document as part of any training? I would have seen that when it was released at compliance. Um, when we have our compliance updates, um, that's when I would have seen that document. Yeah, but were you, did you, were you provided with that document as part of any training in Riskman? No. Okay, can I take you to page 10 of that document? Now, if the operator could 
Thank you. Uh, now, have you? We, we might need to try and thank you. The operator is anticipating me. Um, can you see that table reasonably yes. clearly? Yes, I can. Yes. Have you seen this table before? Oh yes, it's um, on display. It was on display in all our group homes. I see. And what's your understanding of what this table is telling you? It tells me. Um, the nature of how to classify an incident, whether it be client-related, um, staff, or organisational, etc. So um, it, it covers the um, the main type of events that could happen in a, in a group home setting. All right. Now, there are six domains across the top. Do you see that? Yes. Only one of those seems to me to relate to clients at all. Is that fair? Correct, yes. So the vast bulk of the consideration appears to go to the organisational effect of the incident. Is that fair? Yes. Um, is that a client-centred approach in your view? Um, well, um, I be yes, I believe so, because it um, addresses um, what could happen to a client um, uh, with the, the different injuries that all um, you know, near miss or, um, but also um, financial, um, it also that for financial loss of the client, um, I think it, it adequately um, puts the right. client um, at the centre. So Don't forget our staff, our staff mainly work with the client, so I would very see reports about human resources, organisational or reputation, I've never seen a, a risk man for those. So. To be categorised in the client category is insignificant. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a near miss or no injury. Correct. So how is it that an injury of any kind ends up being categorised as insignificant? Um, I can't... I mean, I, I, as I said, I disagree with the classification the staff put on it and I would only be surmising. I don't want to... Uh, yeah. Well, would a bruise ever be properly categorised as insignificant? No, it should be a minor, a minor. Okay, and so how is it that in your reviews that you've told us about having reviewed multiple bruise incident reports, mm -hmm. that insignificant was accepted on each occasion? Um, well, it's the um, supervisor uh, did the initial review and should have changed that. Um, in hindsight, if I was to do it again, I would have I've changed it. I think it moved very quickly, that incident, and um, became escalated very quickly. So reviewing the risk man report, um, I didn't prioritise. I, did, I prioritised the journal entries and um, investigating and meeting with staff and trying to get to the bottom of it. I would do things um, differently now in regards to ensuring that docu documentation matched the actions I took. Well, I'm just trying to understand, can we go back to, for example, the October bruising that was also rated as insignificant? Mm -hmm. Was that properly rated as insignificant? The, are we talking now about the arm, the upper arm? Yes. Yes. Um, Look, that, in hindsight, um, no, it should have been a minor, even though it was deemed um, that it was likely to be um, yeah, the clients, you know, um, so, you know, hurting each other. Does the way that the injury occurred impact on the categorisation for this purpose? It should have been recategorised as minor, yes. Um, all right. Um, can you tell me if you have ever seen a, the document at tab 86, which is a similar document? Now, this says that it is a Riskman Incident Reporting Manual for manager and risk manager level users. Yes. Now, are you a manager level user? Yes, I am. I would. I have full access to the risk man system, so uh, I can see all the different unboxes um, and stuff. Yes. All right. And um, 
So have you seen this document in the context of your training? Um, I, I would have only seen it at, com, um, at compliance when we have compliance updates and we, we meet to talk about the documents. That's when I would have seen. I haven't used that document. Okay. Do you know if you've read that document before this Royal Commission? Uh, only I may have gone through it with my peers when it was first released, but I have not seen it since. All right. Um, now, returning to the injuries of um, the 22nd of February, these were ultimately reported in the report of on risk man at tab 68 in um, the hearing bundle B. Now, this is the report that tells us that the matter has gone to hospital, that the incident has gone to hospital. As I understand it, I'll wait for that document to come up. Thank you. So the, the summary there is summarising the circumstances in which Daniel went to hospital. Is that right? Correct, yes. So the incident that this reports upon is the admission to hospital. Is that right? You were taken to accident and emergency. I don't believe he was admitted. He um, was treated in an accident and emergency and um, discharged. I don't think he spent overnight or go, he did go up to a ward or anything. I believe he... It was all treated. I think if you have a look at the last line of the summary under detail, oh, okay. his client was, was admitted, admitted overnight. Oh, okay. Observations. Yes. So that that report really relates to the admission to hospital. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And so over the page, we'll see that that is categorised as a major incident. Yes. I think we can agree that happened without going over the page. But um, so how does that work? The underlying incidents are identified as insignificant, but the fact of admission to hospital is regarded as major. Um, I think the staff would, would report it as their experience told them that um, obviously a major event had occurred because it required um, outside agencies to be involved required him to go to the hospital and receive treatment, assessment and treatment. Would you agree the focus was really on that hospital admission rather than the injuries in this report? Um, well, I think it was the, the, the support workers aren't medically trained staff, so I think they what they reported was the events that occurred. He was assessed by a locum and a recommendation to go to the hospital um, and with the um, family notified. So yeah, I think it reflects the incident. I don't, um, I mean, any investigation would um, uncover or just the full nature of the event, but it was reported as a, a transfer to, ho um, to um, a hospital. All right. Now, um, the matter was then investigated. Can you tell the commissioners about um, what was involved in that investigation, so far as you're aware, just from your experience? Um, I, every staff member that worked that whole week in um, uh, N Street was uh, spoken to and formally interviewed by me and my HR business partner. Uh, there was a series of questions that were developed um, and um, put to the staff and um, their responses documented and then they were um, uh, had to take that code of ethics training online module and then they were there so we interviewed them over a period of a few days and that information then was sent on for um, triage. All right and what was the conclusion following that investigation what caused these bruises? Um, it was not de determined. Um, staff believed it occurred outside the home, um, but no one could um, come to a determination. Um, did anyone speak with Daniel about it as part of that investigation? Yes, um, 
we spoke with Daniel. Um, the um, I believe the police attempted to speak to Daniel, um, but yes, we weren't able to um, get to the bottom of that. All right, I might ask you to just a moment. I think, uh, you... Mr. Mr. Cunningham, you've suggested uh, that you were told by staff that the bruising that had been detected at 6 a.m. and on Thursday, the 21st of February, they're, they're, that's the day of the week, Thursday, the 21st of February, must have by Friday evening, when the locum comes at 8.30 p.m., expanded into what we saw in photographs. That is that what you were told? Yes, yes, that's what, um, yes. Did you ask anybody any questions about whether that was, in fact, the case? Well, um, I was, yeah, when I was advised of what happened, um, yes, I was, um, I started asking questions to, I can't think of what specific questions I asked at the time, but yes, it was. No, it, it's, when one looks at the two immediately relevant documents, that is Risk Man 21 February, that is the Thursday 6am, mm -hmm. and the Risk Man of received on the Monday, but in fact referring to what happened by way of admission to the hospital on Friday, or at least attendance at the hospital on Friday night. Mm -hmm. When you look at the latter, it says, locum attended, client admitted to hospital overnight and the client refuses to return to the property. Staff was advised by the supervisor on Friday night to call the locum out regarding the bruising previously reported over the prior week, as the client's mother was informed and she so showed some concern regarding the injuries. Locum attended at 8.30 p.m., recommended the hospital, and uh, the client was driven to the hospital. There's nothing in there, is there, about a bruise from six o'clock on the Thursday morphing into extensive... No, bruising. no, the... Um I think the staff, when they do their risk reports, give a like a, a brief summary type of thing. Um, some staff, we would always have to um, engaging with our staff, and we would promote with the supervisors around giving as much information as possible. Um, to, brevity, um, is, bre bre brevity is not the same as omitting critical material, is it? Um, mm, no. What I'm getting at is, it seems odd. <laughs> that it, there's a reference there to the previous bruising and nobody has suggested that the previous bruising over a day and a half has, uh, has become no. ex much, much more extensive. Mm, true. I appreciate you're not a, an investigator and I'm not being particularly critical of you, but I'm just noting that there is something that you would seem, you, one would expect in a report if, if that was the explanation to appear in documentation, after all, that was the official record of what was happening. True, and we do have other, um, like, case notes and the 24-hour report where things were noted, so I think it accumulated to form a picture in the end, but at the time, yes, it, yeah, it was um, not reported correctly or um, sufficiently. Thank you. And um, were any medical professionals involved to give an opinion about the development of the injuries or how they might have been caused? Um, I think because um, it was um, seen initially as a small bruise, it was just the staff just treated locally with the supervisor involved. And I think as it um, became more apparent that um, the injury was greater than first reported, yes, um, you know, medical assistance was sought, etc. I'm sorry, oh, just to be clear, uh, from the 25th of February, when the bruises were as they appeared in the photographs, yes. were medical opinions sought about what could have caused such bruising? Uh, not by myself. Um, uh, and, uh, the, there was the medical report from um, the hospital, the discharge summary, uh, which was seen and um, added to um, the report, but um, of course, uh, Daniel um, stayed with his mum, so I, um, she would have done the follow-up medical appointments and I, um, my team wasn't involved in that. And similarly, was there 
um, any consideration about the age of the bruises, any investigation to the age of the bruises by medical professionals? Um, not to my knowledge, not that I know of. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm, I'm conscious of the time commissioners, but I, I wanted to ask Mr Cunningham whether, did you hear Karen Rogers' evidence this morning about the arrangements that were made for ABM to provide support to Daniel? Yes. And were you, was it the case that ABM was being uh, bullied by department support workers? I, d I don't believe that was the case, no. Okay. Did you receive any reports to that effect? Uh, no, I did not. Um, the only report that was a, a personal reason why he um, uh, withdrew. Um, right. I encouraged him and um, tried to encourage because Karen was really keen to have um, ABM support, and um, I was um, I was too. So, um, but I I couldn't make it happen. And were there reports of bullying by community members or? Um, only hearsay from um, Abian. He, he, was, he was one who spoke to me about it and explained why he couldn't do it. Um, there was no um, suggestion of um, bullying by, by support workers or peers within the group home. They all just wanted the best for Daniel. Okay. Um, all right, I'm just going to check with my instructors, commissioners, uh, if there are other matters that I need to cover, which uh, we'll just take one moment while I do that. Uh, commissioners, I'm told those are the matters um, uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, I understand it's around break time. Uh, and if this is a I'll just, time, I'll, I'll just if I don't mind, to... inquire whether Commissioners Bennett or McEwen have any yes, of questions. Yes. Uh, can you tell us, please, whether, as far as you're aware, any legal representatives wish to ask Mr Cunningham some questions? Do you know? Uh, I can assist there. No. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McEwen, do you have any questions of Mr Cunningham? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I do have one question, Mr Cunningham. When you, uh, your evidence, you said that when you met with staff after the incident was reported, the February 2019, yes. and you said that staff were given a copy of the Accommodation Services Support Staff Guidelines yes. and asked to complete Code of Ethics Awareness Training. Yes. That, that's correct, right? That's correct, yes. So am I to take it and then they had to sign a declaration saying that they had read the guideline and completed the training. Yes. Am I to take it that they had not done any training whatsoever before being employed by Oh, no. You? What did that mean? Um, it was just um, a refresher to, sh um, to hold staff accountable because of the, the lack of um, appropriate reporting and, and escalating of the incident. So um, it was a um, suggestion made by HR at the time that we get the um, employees to undertake the Code of Ethics training as a refresher. So the declaration that you're talking about was on, a, on the point of a refresher. Would they have done, signed a declaration before commencing employment or being employed in the health? Would um, they have signed declaration that they had done training? They would have undertaken their mandatory training at the start of their employment and um, we had compliance training, which I believe was every two years. Um, this was given as a prompt reminder for staff um, of their responsibilities and their obligations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, do you have a, any questions? Uh, I'm conscious of time. I want to ask just a few general questions about N Street. Yes. Firstly, um, the disability support workers, the floating supervisors, the team leaders and yourself, you are all government employees, is that yes, correct? Um, there was no team leaders in the structure. I was the equivalent. I was an ASM and um, uh, the team leader um, in the new structure replaces the ASM. Okay. So I was, um, it was myself as the ASM 
and then I reported to an area manager. But they were all employees of the department? Yes, we had no agency staff on. Um, Karen Rogers gave evidence of other signs of what living in N Street was like. She talked about the personal care of Daniel had deteriorated, that he uh, smelt on many occasions, that his clothes weren't clean, and often that they weren't his own clothes. Mm. She talked about that the residence itself was dirty, that it hadn't been swept, um, an unclean sense to it. And she talked about medication mix-ups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is aside from the incidents that we've just been talking about. This is the general living in N Street of her observations. You had disability workers, a floating supervisor, and yourself that visited what you said regularly, on a semi-regular basis were the words that you used, yes. and including at least quarterly meetings. Yes. Did no one notice that Daniel personal care needed more attention, that the residents needed cleaning, worried about medication mix-ups and people's possessions and that it, Karen's story gave a general air of neglect. And what I'm asking is when there are so many people there, why is it no one else saw that general air of neglect? I think it, it was acknowledged and um, attempts made. Um, I know that um, we had in place um, a roster of work that had to be done where um, floors had to be swept, um, uh, you know, covers um, were kept uh, tidy and the clothes in the white wardrobes. Um, the, we, you know, if carpets needed cleaning, we would get them um, steam cleaned, etc. cetera. Uh, I know as, um, um, uh, as the ASM, when I visited, my focus was more on the administrative tasks, were the finance books I kept up to date, were the case notes kept up to date. Um, I now, as um, an area manager, when I visit sites, I go into clients' bedrooms, I check the wardrobes. I, I, do, I, I do those more intimate um, checks than I would have done at that time as an ASM. I did rely on my um, supervisors to um, have a presence and address those things. Um, in the new structure that we have in place with the supervisors working in um, group homes and the floats not being office space, they're in the houses, that addresses a lot of that um, uh, poor practice that was happening. And I know in my current role, um, the, the standards are a lot higher. There's a lot greater accountability for the support workers. You said that you, with, without criticising you specifically, but you said you did know Daniel. Yes. And did not you notice? Did, did um, people, did people I, not notice that he wasn't clean? No. And that, when I, every time and I that the room wasn't clean and that the general living was not a home that we would want to live in? Um, it was a very large home. Um, it, uh, every time I saw Daniel, he was, you know, either, um, you know, dressed well or he had just come back from day options. Where he went to day options, he was on a farm and he was doing farm labour, farm work. So he was coming back, um, you know, dirty and with mud on his shoes, etc. because that's where he was and he would, as soon as he'd come home, he'd change and get into his, have a shower and get into his pajamas. Um, I, when I visited, I, I never saw anything that really gave me cause from concern. I know the staff um, cared for Daniel, cared for all four men that lived there and were very fond of them. Um, I didn't see anything that would um, cause me uh, concern. Um, I think there was, um, you know, when there's male clients and male staff, um, some of the, the cleaning probably could be done better, but I do know that they, they did sweep and uh, clean and um, 
wash things and if they needed um, specialist cleaning to come in, I would then go through the process and get approval for that, like having the carpets um, steam cleaned, etc., or having curtains washed. But you would agree that from Karen's description that it had um, yes, I would an air of neglect. Yeah. Well, yes, it was. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't nice hearing what Karen had to say this morning, though. No, it was. Concerned. Thank you. Does the department still have a policy of rotation that supports that? Um, I would say it's on an individual area basis. Um, I know I've always worked in areas where the um, managers do encourage rotation. Um, some staff will really fight that. Um, they don't want to move. They build strong connections. And some families don't want staff moved either. So it's an individual basis, but we do try and um, move staff. Yes. I appreciate it's a balance, uh, but there are costs of moving staff. Correct, uh, yes. You're building that new relationship, and especially when it's a single staffed house, it makes it, mm. you know, you don't have that overlap of people. All right. Thank you, Mr Cunningham, for uh, your statements and for giving evidence uh, today. We appreciate your assistance to the Royal Commission. Thank no, you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Bennett, is it appropriate to adjourn? It is now 2.50, more or less, uh, in uh, Adelaide. So shall we resume at uh, 3.10? Uh, as it's convenient to the Commission. Um, do, you want, do you want to come back a little earlier, 3.05? If that's possible, I could, uh, only 15 minutes would be um, yeah. we shall fine return, from my point of view. We shall return at 3.05. Please, Chair. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission has resumed. Yes, Ms. Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Kirkby, I think, appears in the Adelaide hearing room to be uh, sworn or affirmed. Ms. Kirkby, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of the associate who is in the room with you, she will administer the oath. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you, Ms. Kirkby. Um, Ms. Bennett will now ask you some questions just to explain where we are. Ms. Bennett uh, is appearing from Melbourne. I happen to be in Sydney, at our Sydney hearing room, but you do have two commissioners in the Adelaide hearing room with you, Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner McEwen. So we are slightly scattered, but uh, Ms Bennett will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Kirkby. Can you tell the Royal Commissioners your full name? My name is Muriel Charlotte Kirkby. Now, you've uh, made a statement for the Royal Commission, which commissioners appears behind tab 49 of bundle B. Ms Kirkby, have you read the contents of that statement recently? I have. And are the contents of that statement true? They are. Thank you. Now, Ms Kirkby, I'd like to ask you a few questions about uh, the contents of your statement. But first of all, can you tell the Royal Commissioners uh, your current role? I'm the Director of Accommodation Services with the Department for Human Services, with the responsibility of the um, disability group homes and also aged care facility. Now, now Ms Kirkby, I'm just going to ask you to, to slow down the, the timing of your responses. We have interpreters and we also have the added concern around um, the audiovisual link. So if I could ask you to slow it down, that would be great. Apologies, of course. Um, uh, so you've held your current role since about August of 2018, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Now, can you tell me what that role involves? What, what are the core components of that role? So I'm, as I said, the Director for Accommodation Services. So I have a responsibility for uh, 211 of our group homes right across the Adelaide region. And also I have group homes that I have a responsibility for in Mount Gambia and also in Kadena. I, as part of my portfolio, have uh, our Northgate aged care facility 
which is a Commonwealth aged care facility um, within, the, within the state. I provide uh, strategic leadership and uh, direction um, to the service and um, have a responsibility to uh, 530 clients who live within our service um, and also um, the, the staff. So we have in and around um, 1,500 to 1,600 staff. All right, and how many staff are your direct reports, do you know? Um, direct reports, I have, um, I have my director of nursing, I have the manager of quality and safeguarding, I have the manager for NDIS and customer engagement, I have the assistant director of accommodation services, I have a, um, a manager of, um, of strategic projects, and also the last one, um, I have um, a manager that looks after our business systems. So six right, you, plus an EA. Thank you. So you were the sole director from the 6th of August 2018 and before that there were two directors, is that right? That's correct. So before that there were two directorates. Um, one was responsible for the community group homes as I have described and the other which was the position I held um, was for Highgate Park which was the last remaining government institution in South Australia and also the aged care facility, clinical services including nursing services, um, community nursing. May I ask, are all 530 clients uh, participants in the NDIS? No, they're not. Um, I also have uh, 30 aged care um, uh, um, clients in, that, in those numbers as well. So there are about 500 that are, that are participants in the NDIS? I also have some people who are in the COS program, the Continuity of Support program. So it, I, I understand I've probably got, there are probably around 475 um, NDIS participants. Thank you. Uh, now, you said that there are 211 houses in your portfolio. Does that remain the case today? That's correct. And how often do you visit those houses? Uh, very regularly. Um, it is part of my practice to... I, I've got one day a month that I actually block out to go and visit houses across the directorate. Um, I do those visits... Um, um, with the Executive Director of Accommodation Services as well, and we will do those visits with an area manager who will, will host us. So since being in the role, I've probably visited all of the houses. I'm, I'm on my probably third round um, at this stage. All right. When did you first visit N Street? Um, so N Street, um, as I think was, was mentioned on, on one of the days, there are actually three homes in a row um, in N Street. Um, the first time I visited, and I, I'm, I might need to um, just um, have a look at my statement, but the first time I visited was in, um, in 2018, but I only visited um, to N Street. I didn't actually visit the, um, the residents that we're talking about today. So um, as part of my visits, I also do visits at night. So I had gone out on this particular visit um, with the night supervisor, um, and, and we went to number two, N Street. Just to pause, I'm sorry, I should have been clearer. Um, we're using N Street as a kind of a pseudonym yep. to refer to the actual house in which Daniel lived. So when, I'm, when I say N Street, I mean that house, yep. that's okay. And I accept it's a little bit confusing because it, it refers to a street. Yep. Um, if I need to refer to the other houses, I'll yep. do something. Yep. Okay, so when did you first visit N Street? So the first time I visited N Street was on the 25th of February 2019. Um, now, had there been issues with that house before you had visited? I believe there were. I believe there were. And had those issues been escalated to your level? So can I explain to you why I say there, there were? Yes. yes, go ahead. Yep. Oh, yes, please. Um, so, as as you said, when I became director of the um, of 
of the whole of accommodation services um, in 2018. Um, I met with all my senior leaders. Um, so at that time, obviously, as has been explained, there was a different structure in place. So there were about um, uh, um, five, um, five area managers plus two regional managers um, that were reporting into me. Um, shortly after I, um, I became director, we had um, the Oakton report that I'm sure everybody is familiar with that came out in, in South Australia. Um, I had taken that report and copied a copy for all of my senior leaders um, and asked them all to, to read it in the context of our service. And then I, I met with each of them and I said to them, is there, is, talk to me about what, what's in the report and asked them if there were any areas across the service that had any sort of similar um, um, issues or that they were concerned about. That was probably in um, October, November time. Um, and one of the area managers that I met with had mentioned, it had mentioned N Street um, to me as a site where um, there were some significant issues um, and issues similar to, to what has been discussed today around um, culture um, um, and, and general um, cleanliness, etc. That um, was was one of the one of the topics that I had discussed. So I did become aware that that was a site that I should take a take a closer look at. Um, and from that, um, I had been um, talking and engaging with my um, with with our um, director of audit um, and and asked him when he was putting his audit schedule together um, if that was something that he could actually, if that was a house that he could prioritise in, in having a look at when the audit, audits were going through. I did talk to the, to the manager who was responsible for the site at the time um, to get their viewpoint of how things were and if, if there was anything that, um, that they were aware of. Um, and, and certainly there was, a, there was certainly a difference of opinion around um, what, the, um, what one of the area managers who had been responsible for the site for a while, or for a long time, had, had told me versus what the, the, the local management was, was the, what their view was um, at the time. All right, I'd like to explore that with you in a moment, but before I do, I think you might have heard um, the evidence of Mr Cunningham before, is that right? Yes, I did. And you, you heard Commissioner Bennett ask some questions around the air of neglect at N Street. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. And what was just the matters that motivated you to ask for an audit of N Street consistent with a house that had that air of neglect, is that fair? Sorry, I just lost your audio just at the end. I'm sorry. Is it fair that the, you were receiving reports of such an air of neglect about that house and that was part of your motivation for asking for that review? Not specifically in terms of, of the detail that, um, that, that was discussed with, um, with Wayne, um, but just a general feeling of... Um, uh, compatibility issues with the clients, um, staff culture issues, um, and and just a general feeling that that site um, in particular um, needed some attention. Um, so, okay, I will, will. What led you specifically to form the view? that there was an issue of compatibility of staff with residents, there was a possible problem with staff culture um, and some other issues. What, what led you to that conclusion? Yep, so when I had met with um, one of the area managers um, who was responsible for that site, after I, had asked the, um, after I had asked the staff to read the Oakton report um, to give me their view around that and if there were areas within our service that um, had, you know, that, that potentially we could um, have, have issues that, that needed attention. So it was the area manager 
who um, has re since retired with us that had mentioned and it was more compatibility around the, the clients living there. And what particularly did the area manager convey to you that uh, resulted in you forming a view that there was possibly something wrong that needed correction? Um, so the area manager had, had been somebody who'd worked with us for many, many years, was very experienced and had spent um, a, a good part of the latter years of his career um, 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 moving a number of people from the Strathmont Centre out into community living. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was um, that often, you know, and how that process happened in, in the time, you know, at the time. So often you had people who lived together in a, in a villa um, that then would, would move out into a, into a home together. And, you know, often there were people who had similar disabilities, similar behaviour issues and things like that. And his, one of his concerns was that, you know, that's, that's probably not the best thing to have people with similar disabilities and similar behaviour issues actually living in the, in the same home. Um, and so that was, that was part of the discussion that we had had in terms of compatibility. Um, so often we had people who, you know, potentially were, there might have been two people who had a, who, who, who were biters, if you like, who lived together or um, who had um, various behaviours of concern and things like that. Um, and then also we talked about um, general staff attitude um, because, you know, a number of the staff that we had um, working in the service were staff who had worked in an institutional model and then had transitioned into a community model but not really made that transitional shift. So um, we had a number of conversations around that and how we needed to, to change culture and how we needed to change people's attitudes from, um, you know, a hotel model if you like but in an institutional model where everything was done at a particular time to a particular timetable and then versus what that what that looks like in a, in a community house and what does community engagement look like, what does um, real true engagement in the community um, look like as well. So we had a number of conversations around, around that and just staff attitude in general. So look, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms Kirkby, but our transcript has stopped. So uh, could we just check what the status of the transcript is? So that we haven't lost any of your evidence. I apologise for interrupting. Fine. Has our transcript uh, recuperated? We're, we're getting it connected, but it's still being recorded. So we'll still have a transcript. It is still being recorded. We, we're just getting it reconnected with the writer. I'm told, um, Chair and Commissioners, that the transcript is still being recorded, but the live transcript is not presently connected and will be reconnected. So I don't know whether we need the reconnection for those who are in the hearing room who are following the um, live transcript or council who are behind us. Do we have an indication of how long it will take to re-establish the connection? I, I believe we have it back, Chair. I, um, I can see my words appearing. I'm told that we have it back, so we shall proceed on the assumption that it has recuperated and made a full recovery. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, Ms Kirkby, your answer, I wasn't, I wasn't clear whether your answer was directed to specific concerns about N Street or whether what had been conveyed to you by the experienced manager were general comments. General comments, um, but enough to put it on my radar. Um, I had come from um, having a, a small part of the portfolio in, in, as I said at the start, in Highgate Park and an aged care facility where everybody was grouped together and, and obviously we, we went through a, a, a process um, with everyone to, to transition into the community in a particular way. Um, taking on yeah, the just, wider sorry, portfolio... Sorry, sorry, to, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but there must have been something, I assume, 
that uh, caused you to connect the general comments made by the manager to the specific facility at Hen Street? Yes, so I had asked the question if there was any, if there was, if there was, for, of all of the managers, if there were any particular areas that they had concerns about. Um, and that was one of the, the homes that um, that particular manager had suggested. And it was very general comments, but I was, as I say, I was new into the position and needed to, um, needed to start my visits and to, to start looking at the service to get a sense of the service. So the best way that I felt I could get a sense of the service was to talk to the people who had been working in the service um, for a long time. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think we'll get Ms. Bennett back to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, um, you had some concerns in October of 2018 about N Street. Is that fair? Yeah, October, November, yes. Yes. Uh, and around that time, you were monitoring uh, risk man reports as they were coming through from all levels. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And you saw some risk man reports come through about some bruising, some unexplained bruising. Yes, I right? did. Yes. I think you tell us about that at paragraph 77 of your statement. And did that cause you any concern that a house that had been flagged for you as a house of concern um, yes, uh, it, had unexplained bruising coming? Uh, yes, it did. Um, and as, as I think was uh, discussed with Wayne just previous around the, um, the, the notification around the bruising being insignificant and there was there were a number of bruises um, or there were certainly two uh, risk mans that I was aware of that um, in that in that week preceding the um, the 22nd of, of February and, and subsequently the 25th of February that were deemed on risk man to be small bruises and I think one was um, was described as being the size of a, a five cent piece which suggested that it was it was a small bruise and actually I do recall reading both of the the the, the bruising reports um, on that week one when it was a, um, a a small red mark and then a couple of days later when it appeared that it was the same bruise being reported again but it had then progressed to a bruise so I actually remember that that, that rang a bell for me and I thought well that's that's good that reporting is happening um, you know, in that sense. But as we now know, the, the reporting was completely inadequate for, for the size and the scale of, of what was happening in, in, um, with Daniel's bruising. Yes, now you tell us that in your statement that um, staff are expected to report in accordance with the various risk man manuals. Do you recall giving that evidence? Yes. It's a paragraph 26. I think you say authorised and expected. They're not required to do that? They are required, yes. Okay, and and you provide them with training about how to use that system. So the risk man system is our previous system. It's not the system yes. that we we currently use. So um, the risk man system, I understand, was in place from about t 2009, which which predates my um, coming into the service. My understanding. So so I I can't tell you what what training happened. In, in 2009 onwards, but certainly um, risk man training um, was something is was something at the time that there were a lot of manual um, um, d um, manuals, if you like, in in the homes as to how you report on risk man and how you record. And I think that um, a lot of the um, the um, direction around how to use risk man was done at a local level. That's my understanding. Can I just pause there? I just want to, I just want to go slowly. I, I just want to be clear about my question. Um, so you say in your statement they're authorised and expected, but you say now they were required um, and you required them to comply with the policies that you've listed at paragraph 26. Is that how I understand your evidence correctly? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Um, now, you heard Mr Cunningham tell us that he never re received formal training in those manuals. You heard that evidence? I did. Um, 
Did you ever take any steps to know whether training was being provided in those manuals that staff were required to comply with? Um, I did, but um, the training that... Um, uh, so I, I did become aware that the, the risk man system was been used in a particular way, um, and it was clear that it was more of a reactive system than a proactive system. When I um, developed the new structure and we had a manager of quality and safeguarding um, in, in place, one of the first things that we actually did was um, really investigate what was happening with the risk man system, particularly around we had hundreds of open risk man reports that actually, so a risk man um, report has a, has a process to it where you've got the person who will um, log that risk man in the first place, then there's a number of other people that may well be involved with the risk man around um, doing remedial actions and then it is actually the expectation of the area manager to, to close those risk mans off. So when the manager of practice and quality um, was recruited, one of the things that we talked about was how many open risk man reports there were and one of the questions that we both asked was, well, why are they open and, what, and, sorry, and did people pause. have I'm training? I'm interrupt you for a moment, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to return to my question. And, and my question really was just about the training. Yep. And the proposition I want to put to you is that, that it wasn't being provided by DHS in late 2018 and early 2019. Staff weren't being trained in riskmen. Is that fair? Um, so we, what, what I was, if I just... just if I just finish that sentence, if that's okay, it's just the we took all of the um, the area managers and the team leaders, and we we put them all through training on risk man, um, and that would have been um, I would have to check dates, but it would have been towards the end of um, uh, twenty. No, it would have been at yeah, it would have been towards the end or the begin the beginning. Uh, sorry, of um, of twenty nineteen. Um, in regards to our support staff, our support staff um, would have been given on-the-job training, really, around uh, risk man reporting, is my understanding. Okay. So, fair to say there was no specific formal training for the support officers? That I'm aware of, no. No, and they were the ones who were responsible for the initial report that determined who saw that incident report. Is that fair? Yes, um, risk inaccurate man. reporting. So just to just to pause there, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, but, you're fine. Yeah. Um, so inaccurate reporting by the initial reporter can infect and affect the way that an incident is treated in the future. Is that fair? That is fair. My understanding is there are there are trigger words within the report that actually triggers um, um, an, an escalation as well. Um, now, I don't have those off the, just off the top of my head. All right. Um, there's one. Um, I want to just ask one question about the um, bundle B tab 87. Now, this is about riskman for managers. Now, at page 20 of that document, it seems to set out what the manager should be doing in response to a report that has been received in risk man. Hopefully that document will become available any moment. Just on page one. Yes, so we're, I think Mr Cunningham told us that this is the manager level manual. So this is for the people at a level above the operator or the immediate reporter. Sorry. I'm sorry, I said page 20. I think I meant page 10. Sorry, I'm still on page one on the page that's coming. Look. Thank you. Just find me where it says which page, which part of page 10 would you like expanded? I just wanted to have a look at that table again to see if we had understood it correctly. Well, it's a bit hard with uh, the table in that form. 
And we have I'm hoping that the operator will uh, do the thing that they did the last time and um, rotate it. I'm afraid I can't see it from where I am. Perhaps I can do it this way, Ms. Ms. Um, I, Kirby. I, I can see it if you... If you oh, don't. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I couldn't see it. Yeah. Um, can you just tell me how does the person choose which category they are looking at in an injury that might have other... an incident that might fit into multiple categories, which one predominates? Within accommodation services, I would say almost always the client um, category would be used. Um, health and safety, and safety um, for some issues, but to be honest, as, as I think Wayne might have mentioned, those, the other categories were hardly ever used by um, the, the staff who were reporting on risk men. Um, the, the client category was the one that was picked almost every time, I would say. And were supervisors expected to review risk man and would they amend it if they saw fit? Um, yes, they, they could be. Yes. And would they ever change any of the substantive details of the report that you're aware of? Um, the only details that would get changed would be if the report, quite honestly, didn't make sense. Um, if there were issues of language, so if there were language barriers with the person making the making the report and the person receiving the report, sometimes one might read a risk man and and try. It would be very difficult to follow what was actually going on. So often a manager would go back to the staff member and and talk to the staff member about um, what it was that they were trying to say and and amend that, or, or they may well put in a um, a notation to the risk man. All right. So there was no suggestion that statements would be removed prior to investigation, or oh no, they're no. kept there and then added to. Is that the way it's meant to work? That's right. Yes, and it is a fully auditable system. So if somebody did go in and um, interfere with the report in any way, that 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 was on a um, you know on a timeline sort of tracked as to who right, that was. Yes. Yeah, so you can actually go back and see who's entered data at any given time. That's right. And are you aware that anyone does review um, if they find a problem in riskman reporting? Is there any process for checking if that problem is more widespread? Um, at the time when we were using riskman there were multiple, many, many, many risk man reports coming through in a day. Um, the system was used more in a, um, in a reactive way as opposed to really looking at trends um, that, that, that were, were happening in the service. Um, so some managers might look at trends um, and certainly um, we, we had the ability to look at trends, um, but it, the system wasn't necessarily used in that way. And as I said, this is our previous system. All right. Now, I wanted to ask you if you ever met Daniel. Do you remember if you've ever met him? Yes, I've met Daniel many times and actually was lucky enough to be at his 40th birthday that Karen spoke about earlier. Yes. Before Christmas. And um, what about Mitchell? Have you ever met Mitchell? Yes, I've met Mitchell a few times as well. Yes. Um, and how, how do you feel your relationship is with um, the families of both Mitchell and Karen? Um, so I, um, I have I have met um, Karen uh, many times um, through the um, unfortunate incidences that that obviously we were talking about um, today. Um, I also um, have worked with Karen in a um, professional capacity as well. Um, Karen, as I think she mentioned, um, worked for Purple Orange, and she was very heavily involved. Um, with the training of our client influencers group that we set up a few years ago and was very involved in our um, in developing our client customer charter with um, with um, with the the client influencers group and, and myself um, I have met uh, Victoria and James um, uh, once just face to face but I had spoken to um, James a, a number of times on the phone um, just um, over the years about, about various matters. Um, I want to return to that in a moment, but um, have you sought input into the policies that you list in your statement from the families of 
those who live with them, live with those policies, that is. Which, which policies in... in but paragraph 49, you, you go through a lot of policies, but I'm particularly looking at paragraph 49. These are the policies that are said to operationalise your zero tolerance to abuse and yep. neglect of people with disability strategy. Yep. So and there are 11, there are 11 there. Uh, are these the result of consultation with the families or with the people who receive services from DHS? Uh, zero tolerance to abuse and neglect, absolutely. Um, so the, some of the um, first policies that are mentioned on, um, on point 49, managing incidents in the workplace and critical client incidents, etc. none of those ones are my policies, so they're the policies of the director of um, the IMU. Um, so certainly um, I was, families and the people we support were very involved with our, um, with our um, um, uh, zero tolerance to abuse and neglect um, and our um, quality practice and safeguarding framework. Um, so our client influencers group um, certainly have um, provided um, a lot of feedback around um, um, some of the things that they would like to see um, in the service and in, in, in our policies and in our practice moving forward. Uh, and so are you able to say whether the any of the documents at 49 were the subject of consultation with families or they're just not owned by you? Um, I, don't, I don't believe they were. Um, they, th those policies, as I said, they're not owned by me, but I don't believe that uh, critical incident policies or um, reporting policies um, um, have been, um, have had any family or client input um, at all. Customer feedback and complaints policy, um, again, our, our, um, we have had clients involved um, with those um, and feedback. Um, uh, certainly, um, that there has been um, um, feedback from clients in in, the, in those policies. And um, all right, so you've received feedback about that, but you've perhaps not actively sought it. Is that right? Uh, no, we actively sought it. Okay. Uh, in respect of all of them, or just that one? Uh, uh, customer feedback and complaints um, and zero tolerance to abuse and neglect customer charter. Okay. Is it important to you to be transparent in your investigations and the outcomes of investigations that concern people who receive services? Absolutely. And um, certainly acknowledge that we, we need to do better. What makes you say that briefly? Um, well, I, I obviously um, watched um, Victoria and um, James's um, um, statement yesterday, and it absolutely we, we we absolutely need to do better and and will do better um, in that space. Um, and and obviously listening to uh, Karen Rogers this morning, again, you know we we absolutely need to do better in 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 our feedback and in our um, giving feedback to families. So, um, yeah, absolutely, we, we need to improve. The, the letter that was received about Mitchell was pretty horrifying, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, heartbreaking, totally heartbreaking. And to listen to um, Victoria and um, James's pain yesterday um, was, was really, really hard to watch. And I, and I don't think um, anybody would would you know discount in any way the pain that receiving a letter like that um, would would cause and and the not knowing obviously is is who 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 would who would do such a thing is it's completely heartbreaking to even think that anyone would write such a letter um, about about anyone particularly um, about a vulnerable person I think the not knowing who who did it. The, the thought as the director of a service that there's potential that one of my staff could have written that absolutely sends shivers down my spine. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really awful. Yes. Um, you, you gave some evidence in your statement that you provided some uh, counselling and support for uh, the Rogers family. Did you provide the same offer to Mitchell's family? 
to Mitchell? Uh, no, and it's, it's no excuse to say that I wasn't the director at the time, um, but it's certainly something that I will be reaching out um, to Mitchell's family and offering that, albeit, you know, that may well be, um, you know, too little, too late, but I absolutely want to, to work with Mitchell's family to ensure that they get the support that they, that they need and deserve. Are you able to volunteer your view as to why there might have been differential treatment between those two cases? Why one was supported in that way and one was not? Or offered support in that way and the other was not? Yeah, well, well, as I, um, as I said, I, I actually wasn't the, the director of the entire accommodation services when the matter of the, um, the letter was um, happened, but I was the director of accommodation services when... Um, when um, Daniel um, went through his his uh, bruising, and so I I, I walked right along um, the the journey with um, Karen and Graham and Daniel, um, which is which is quite different. I, as I say, I wasn't the actual director responsible um, at the at the time of um, of the letter. That was Claude Bruno, who was the um, who was the um, director of accommodation services at the time. You were the director while some investigations were being carried out, weren't you? No. no. So I was, I was the director um, with the following on of the Ombudsman's recent report, but that yes. was actually, um, yeah, it was some time before I became um, director. Yes, all right. Um, and I think in your evidence you said that um, uh, you, off, that you provided two to three counselling sessions for Karen and four for Daniel, uh, and I think we heard from Karen this morning that um, there was slightly less than that accepted. Is, is are we to understand your evidence to be that that number of sessions was offered, but only one was taken up? Yes, and actually, I I, I did speak to to Karen actually today at the break. Um, they they were the sessions that um, I had I had spoken to the various councillors around. Um, um, providing in the first instance obviously the relationship with the councillor and the um, and you know Karen and um, Graham and um, and Daniel I, I hadn't actually realized that they hadn't taken up all of the all of the sessions but they're they're still available to them as I said um, to Karen now I'm, I'm going to just pass you a few issues that have arisen uh, as I've reviewed your materials I'm going to do it at a reasonably uh, quick pace having regard to the time so I'm going to move around a little bit. Um, but you tell us that uh, the IMU uh, would only investigate a matter after South Australian police have concluded your investigation. Does that remain your understanding of the situation? That's my understanding, yes. And um, are there any, invest any times that investigations will be appropriate um, before the South Australian police have concluded their investigations? Um, well, that, that would be a matter for the director of the IMU to make that decision, I think. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of any... I'm not aware. OK. Um, I wanted to take you back to you, your evidence before about certain trigger words that could trigger an escalation in risk man. Remember that evidence? Yes. Do you know where we would find information about those trigger words? Uh, I could certainly provide that to the Commission afterwards. All right. I also just wanted to understand about um, going back to tab 86. Uh, this is the uh, risk man um, document again the, at, at page seven. Um, that document in bundle B tells, as I read it, under the heading... I'm not sure if that document is, is, is there now. Can you see the heading there, review the detail of the incident? So are we on page seven? Yes, page seven, review the detail of the incident. Can you see that? Could, perhaps the operator could... I actually can't, I'm sorry. Um, Can I'm we sorry. enlarge it, oh. please? Okay, which part of the page do you want? The, the heading that says review the detail of the incident. Yes. About halfway down the page. 
Yes. Now, this is, I understand, a direction to the manager to um, review the detail of the incident recorded in risk management. And I wanted to ask you about the second last bullet point where it says, remove any inappropriate statements or unfounded allegation as organisational policy may dictate. Now, what organisational policy is being referred to there? Mm. I'm sorry, I'll have to take that on notice. I, I'm unaware of any um, organisational policy that would suggest to remove remove any any evidence from a or any any details from a um, from a risk ban, other than what I said. If if actually it didn't make any sense, um, or um, something like that, that that there would be a change. But again, you'd be able to see the history of that. It, it says here that the person is directed to remove unfounded allegations, and I don't quite understand how that a removal could take place before an investigation. Mm. Yeah, I agree. That, I'll, I'll need to take that one on notice if that's, a, if that's appropriate. Um, all right. Um, that appears in two places in that document, just so that you're aware and your instructors are aware. That, that appears at page 7 and it's repeated at page 20. Uh, and appears on its face to be a, um, a direction to remove allegations prior to investigation. Um, I take it you can't take that any further for the Commission? I can't, no. All right. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you briefly about the financial arrangements uh, for people living in group homes. You heard some evidence that informal arrangements are quite common. Did you hear that evidence? I did. So, as I understand it, adult clients with no guardianship orders in place um, have their funds provided to... Well, can you tell me um, what are the processes in place for people with informal arrangements like Daniel? I actually can't answer that question. Um, our finance, our, our, our finance um, area manages the finances with, with, with families and guardians. Yes. Um, well, do you see any issues with um, an informal arrangement of that kind in place for Daniel, as an example? Um, well, I think our, um, our, our financial arrangements um, or, the, or the, the, the finance division of the department is, is certainly a heavily regulated and audited um, um, part of government. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think they... They, they run to a, a you know a very very high standard. So is there a is there an appointed custodian or trustee for Daniel's money? Um, well, Daniel was under the public trustee, I believe, and now Daniel's mum is his um, is, is his financial uh, manager. And so you you say that he was um, subject to the public trustee. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Um, I, th I think his, his money, his, well, his money was, was, I think, managed by the client trust. Yes. Um, which, is, which is administered um, within DHS. So his, his money was managed in, in that way. But, but not I, by I, a I don't actually by know a lot of details about it. Um, how, yeah. Ms. Kirkby, right. as I understand the evidence that's been given, apparently these informal arrangements quite often involve cash being on the premises and dispersed by the staff as required. Is that your understanding? Um, so um, different clients would receive amounts of money depending on what activities they were, um, they were taking part in. So, for instance, if somebody went out, you know, to... I'm not, I'm not asking about the source of funds. I'm asking about what form the funds took when they were available at the... Home. The, is it common practice for there to be a pool of cash? There is. Yes, it is common practice. So, um, isn't there, that an, isn't isn't that an invitation for misuse of money? Why wouldn't Why wouldn't the department have a policy of debit cards or even credit cards where there's a record of expenditure and the opportunities for misuse are uh, minimum? Yes. So um, debit cards are um, something that we have been trying to move to, and we've been trying to um, um, have a more um, streamlined system of of cash because 
the um, cash moving in, in homes, there, there is a lot of cash that um, you, you get, gets moved and gets counted a lot of times in houses. We've got a lot of checks and balances in each house for the counting of cash. Um, to make sure that the right cash balance is is in place between shifts, which, as you can imagine, is um, taking time away from from other things that uh, staff would be doing that would be a lot more um, person-centred and, and useful if we didn't actually have this um, um, cash within the homes. Um, there's been a number. So I, I, I take it the answer to my question is it would be a good idea. Oh, it's a fantastic away. idea. Um, there are a, a number of challenges um, with it, believe it or not, um, and some of yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a, it's a really um, it, it is something that we would love to do. And some clients, of course, do have um, debit cards, but in a vast majority of our clients don't. Yes, well, cash is so yesterday, so I, I'm told. I totally agree. Though it's also balancing that with a number of our clients actually prefer to have cash for the bunning mm. sausage and all of those sorts of things. But it is something that we have put a lot of time and effort into actually over the last, I think, about two years. Good. But we still have not okay. solved it. <laughs> Okay, we'll go back right. to Ms. Pitt. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Well, I'll, um, I, I wanted to I wanted to finish up by taking you to an email um, at HB, sorry, Hearing Bundle B, tab 52. Uh, and this is an email that follows on from the bruising in February 2019. And you said here... There are so many things wrong with this. I would like you to follow up with a matter of urgency, please. And I want to just confirm with you that this was your impression at the time and this, these were your concerns about the house at the time. You said lack of reporting, and that was about the bruises that were, being, that, that were not reported in a timely way. Is that right? That's correct. And that was a concern for you? Huge concern. Huge concern. And it was a concern that it can impact on the effectiveness of a subsequent investigation, is that right? Well, it was more around um, the fact that um, we have, as, as you've been through with, um, with Wayne, we've, we've had a number of um, poor reporting practices on the week um, leading up to a, a family member receiving a phone call to, to get a locum to come and have a look at her son on a, on a Friday night. Um, with, you know, then, you know, in terms of the notification of me actually being notified of that bruising and the severity of that bruising, I actually wasn't noticed until the Monday, uh, um, notified until the Monday. Um, and I was notified by Karen, um, which is absolutely not appropriate. Um, so therefore, you know, there was there was a lot of time went by there, and as as you say, absolutely, it it affected the investigation, and it also um, affected our transparency and trust and all of those sorts of things with the family. So, you know, when when Karen rang me and sent me the photographs of the bruising, again, I was completely horrified that I was hearing this from a mum as opposed to internally. And you say the staff apparently sleeping on duty, according to the mum. Staff apparently being lazy, and this is known. Those, were those some of the cultural problems you'd been informed about, or were these matters that were raised after? Look, they were, they were alluded to um, previously, but um, you, know, you, you look for evidence for some of these things. Now, obviously, I had started, um, you know, I had started looking at, at some of these things, but hadn't specifically been to N Street to, to look at these things. But on the Monday when I, um, when I met Karen and Graham and um, Daniel at N Street with the other managers, the, these were certainly some of the things that, that I saw, um, yes. which absolutely horrified me. So when you ask the question, well, did, oh, I think it was your colleague asked the question around, well, is nobody seeing like when you open the front door, oh, sorry, when you open the front door and, and you're, you're met with the smell of urine, does nobody ask a question about that? So what does that say about what's going on in that house? When you say the staff apparently being lazy and this is known, what do you mean by that? This is known by who? Senior so, staff? So when I had spoken to, to Karen, so I'd had, um, 
you know, a, a huge conversation with Karen and Graham um, on that Monday in Daniel's bedroom. Um, and it was like um, Karen's floodgates opened with a number of things that she had concerns about over the years that I was unaware of. And, um, and I think Karen has put it in her, her, her I think, I, think I, I heard her, her mention it in her own statement around choosing our battles. And Karen said to me, I choose my battles. And again, that's something else that as a director of the service, I don't, I don't want to hear that families are feeling they need to choose their battles. And, and why is that? And what does that say about our culture? And what do we need to do about it? So Karen had said to me that she had raised some of these matters around, um, you know, the staff are lazy. You know, she had uh, um, come to um, visit. Um, I mean, she, she visited quite a lot, but, um, you know, she, she visited and, you know, she, she felt that staff member had opened the door and it appeared that they may have been sleeping. Um, and and some, some of those are the other issues that um, Karen raised today around the quality of Daniel's clothes and, and, yeah. And you attended the house that day and you observed the house to be dirty, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. It was disgraceful. And, that, and was Commissioner Bennett's characterisation that it had an air of neglect, a, a fair characterisation for you that day? Absolutely. Yes. And is it acceptable that a, a house that is the home of these people was presenting in that way? Absolutely not. Yes. Absolutely not. Um, Commissioners, those are the matters I seek to explore with Ms Kirkby this afternoon. Um, I'll hand back Thank to you. Thank you very much. Please. Ms Kirkby, I'll just uh, ascertain from uh, my colleagues whether they wish to ask questions. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, do you have a question of Ms Kirkby? Um, thank you. I want to talk a little bit about in your submission from paragraphs 35 to 46, you talk about the zero tolerance strategy. Um, and this goes to the culture of organisations. What do you actually do with staff so that in para 37 that they actually understand, recognise and name all forms of abuse and neglect? Um, we just talked about the smell, the filth, how are staff trained that they see those signs, let alone the more extreme signs of physical abuse that have been referred to? Um, that, and it goes to writing letters of name calling and threats. What actually happens in the, I understand, two weeks of intense training? Well, there, I think there are perhaps a number, <laughs> number of questions there. So let's start with the one that uh, how, how do you ensure that staff understand, recognise and name all forms of abuse and neglect? I think that was the first question. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an excellent question. And I, and I think, well, one of the main things that I do is I, the first person that they meet when they come to their induction is actually myself and the Executive Director of Accommodation Services. So um, certainly we, ha we actually talk, I actually talk to people to try and engage hearts and minds and make documents into living living things. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important to 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 really engage with, with new staff and existing staff, but I'll talk about existing staff in a second if that's okay. But certainly all new staff that come into the service, I talk to them about um, zero tolerance to abuse and neglect, and I talk to them about what that is. And I will often start by saying, when we talk about abuse and neglect, we all think, well, that's not me because we go to those big ticket items, as I call it, we, we go to sexual abuse, physical abuse, financial abuse, and we forget about the, you normally don't start there, that's not where abuse starts. Abuse starts, I think, when you open the front door and you smell urine um, meeting you, or you, um, you, some of the work that we've done with the client influencers group, one of the things that they are very, very passionate about is that they are presented to the world in the best way possible. And that includes having having clean breath, you know, having their teeth brushed, having their hairs brushed, actually looking looking nice and being presented how they want to present to the community. So I talked to I'm all sorry, of sorry, sorry to interrupt it, Ms. Kirkby, but is the answer to Commissioner Bennett's question that the way staff come to understand, recognise and names all forms of abuse and neglect is because you talk to them 
have at their induction and convey that information to them. Is, is that what you're telling us? Well, I guess it's, 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 it's probably not as simple as that, yes, but it's, I mean, that's one aspect of it. I think it's about seeing yourself in, in the client and it's about um, seeing, seeing what would you want if you were in, in the service? What would you want? How would you want your loved one to be presented and how would you want your loved one to be um, cared for in the service? So it's about making the policies real, I think, to people. Does your training invite people with disability and their family and carers to come and tell your staff about how they perceive what could be abuse and neglect and what their aspirations are and how they want to live. Is it included that you have a first, a, a voice, a first-hand account of those expectations? So at this moment in time, we've got a limited um, connection into our inductions with the people with lived experience. However, that is in our plan to, to have everything about you with you, to have our clients and our families involved in everything from recruitment through to, to training and expectations. That, that is our, our longer term um, strategy as we, we work through. We've got a number of things that we need to, to develop and that's certainly um, high up on our agenda. And last question, Chair, since he's guiding me on how to ask questions. <laughs> One of your commitments is capacity building. Yes. How are you training staff to actually um, work directly with clients and families, coordinating, facilitating supports and services, growing supports and networks? Are they being trained and understand what that means for the client? Yes, absolutely. So we have um, eight roles currently that are actively working across um, the seven areas. Um, and they are working with um, the clients, their families, they're working with the staff within each house in developing capacity and, um, and accessing um, other other supports for, for clients as well, so external advocacy, external um, community engagement. So it's definitely, capacity building is, is absolutely um, a growing. And those networks are mainstream parts of our community? Absolutely, yes. It's about being an equal citizen. It's about, you know, um, I talked very, very briefly, I might have mentioned um, the, the reconnecting to, to community um, moving people out of uh, Highgate Park, the last remaining institution. One of the things that we, we did was we worked very closely with individuals moving into their new communities to make sure that their likes were um, taken into consideration, whether it was um, you know, linking in with the local libraries, the local community centres, the local activities councils, um, that people are fully engaged in in their communities and that they have their supports around them um, in mainstream, absolutely. Last question, and are you monitoring to see if that practice training aim is actually working and are you going to be able to report on the success of these initiatives and when would that be? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we've done with the new structure um, is that we have these roles within the service, working within the service, but reporting out to a manager that isn't within that line, if that makes sense. So therefore, those people are actually, um, the staff are reporting against specific KPIs and are we are able to, to monitor. We have also, um, been, um, been surveying our clients as well. So um, client satisfaction survey, how are you going? What's working well for you? What's not? What would you like to see more of? All of those sorts of things. So we've just done our second client survey um, uh, recently and um, the, the results of that are just in the process of being collated. And that'll be shared with the NDIA? It certainly can be, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, one question, Ms Kirkby. You said that you have 211 houses under your auspice and you try and visit, one day a month you've set aside to visit houses so that you can see for yourself as you've described with N Street. Yeah. How many houses would you visit in one day? Well, it just depends on the, on the clustering. So I, I should say 211 sites. So um, some of our... 
Um, so, so if I went to um, Mount Gambia as an example, um, there are there are eight eight homes there. So I would visit all homes on the one day. Um, same for Kadena, um, and then like I say on average one day a month. I might meet, I might visit more homes um, depending on on what's on what's going on. Okay, so taking Mount Gambia, you described eight houses in one day. So how much time actually in one house would that, that would be less than one hour, can I suggest? Well, again, it depends. Um, so, you know, if, if I'm in Mount Gambia, it might be, it might be an overnight. Um, I might go and share a meal with, with um, there's one particular lady that likes to do that when I, when I visit. I might go to a basketball game, um, which I have done in the past with a number of people who play, um, or it might be some people just want to see you for a, a you know a, a shorter period of time. All right, I'll get specifically to the point. Is okay, you go into a house. It would take more than an hour. It would take days to get a sense of the culture. I'll put it to you. It would take days to get a real sense of the culture or what's happening in that house. So how could you? I'll put it to you. It wouldn't be adequate for you to get a real sense. Or, for example, you were shocked to discover the state of N Street. So how can you do that to the all 211 houses in, in the time you have? Yeah, so I, I guess I respectfully answer that question, that if I go back to the experience of N Street, I knew there was a problem with N Street when the front door was open. Um, when, you get that, when you get that smell of, of urine, when you walk through the house and see some of the things that I saw, um, I guess I've been working in the disability sector now for, for 30 years and I've worked in, in lots of different aspects and configurations of models and, and I think um, you do get a sense when you walk through and, and also when you meet with the people in the homes, um, looking at their appearance, taking on board um, some of those things that, that were brought out in terms of Daniel's statement, how, you know, are people clean? How, how is their oral hygiene? How, how is their clothes? Do they, are they happy? Um, I, I agree that it is a, a, a short uh, period of time for me as director in that space, but also I'm just one person who's visiting as well. Our area managers have an actual um, KPI around visiting all of their homes for a longer period of time on a three monthly basis and team leaders visit the homes on a monthly basis and that's their expectation and they would be there for longer periods of time all right i, I, I might just interrupt i'm, I'm sorry i'll conclude I, I, sorry I'm, chair i'll just conclude sorry, can, yeah commission M commission McEwen, it was one question i see the time and I've, i understand there's an application all right, with all due respect i'll just conclude by putting it to miss kirkby in the time you have it unreasonable, isn't it, to 211 houses to get a real deep sense of the culture. You just described N Street as one example. I put it to you, it's unreasonable to be able to achieve that mm. in, in, in your capacity. Well, and thank you. I, um, I certainly, I mean, visits are one thing, but also it's about looking at what are, what are some of the trends and incidents. Um, so I might spend a longer period of time at a house where um, there may be a number of incidents for that particular house. To get a sense, I may go back and visit again. Um, I may ask the area manager to do some follow-up work. But I think it's very important for all of our um, layers of management to actually go and visit and meet with the clients and actually um, start to build that um, to, to build that relationship with the, with the people we support. Right. But I absolutely take your point. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Now there's, uh, thank you, Ms. Bennett. I think you all finished your examination of Ms. Kirkby. Um, Ms. Eastman, I understand there may be an application. Can you help me as yes, to how it's Yes, so the, the other parties with leave uh, don't uh, require any questions of Ms. Kirkby. Mr. O'Brien, who acts for Victoria and James, wants to make an application to ask some questions. Yes. Do you have a view about this? Um, it would be my view, given Ms. Kirkby's evidence this afternoon, about the nature and the extent of the interaction that she had with Victoria and James, and in light of some evidence in Victoria's written statement, but not addressed orally, that the matters that Mr O'Brien wishes to address may have little utility to the overall inquiry for this particular case study, 
um, but uh, it is Mr O'Brien's application and he may explain the relevance of these questions to the evidence. Yes, thank you. Mr O'Brien, you've heard what Ms Eastman has to say. Uh, what, uh, how do the questions you propose to put advance uh, the position of the Commission on the issues that have been identified? There, there are two topics about which uh, I'd seek on instructions to ask this witness about. Uh, they, are, they are they are the appointment of um, the person who uh, was uh, who was the catalyst really for the bringing about of the, the the writing of the letter which was sent to Victoria and James on the third of of March 2018, the reappointment of her into a line of responsibility by this witness, and secondly. Uh, th th I'm, that sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand that. So the, the, the person who, the, the, the author of the letter uh, that has become exhibited in these proceedings at 14.1... The um, unidentified ref author. Ref ...referred to the, the forced uh, movement or removal of a, uh, of a manager from the residence uh, as being the catalyst for the letter, the catalyst, therefore, for the threats. That person, yes. that person uh, left but was then reinstated in a, in a position which had a line of authority to the residents uh, later on uh, and, and under the directorship of this witness, as I understand it. That's certainly the evidence of Victorian James. And, we, and the second point? The second point is the response by the department um, after the draft ombudsman's response uh, report was made I, uh, I, available. Yeah, I don't think you should uh, be permitted to ask the second. That, that raises a whole range of issues that have already been explored and no doubt will be explored by council assisting further. Mm -hmm. And if there are issues you want to raise, uh, want council assisting to raise, I suggest that overnight you talk with her and uh, she can then uh, determine what is appropriate. If you want to ask Ms Kirsby about the first matter, then please ask some rather specific questions about that, and we'll see how we go, but I don't anticipate this will take very long. Uh, Chair, before that occurs, could I just draw Mr O'Brien's attention to paragraph 90 of Victoria's statement? Victoria's statement. Yes. And I ask that Ms Kirkby's attention also be drawn to that paragraph. Can that be brought up on the screen, please? The reference is uh, 0361 0001017. And then the following page as well. Mr O'Brien, you've seen that paragraph? Yes, I have. We're still waiting for it to come up, I think. I think, yes. Could we enlarge, please, paragraph 90? So that Ms Kirkby can see it. Thank you. Can you see that, Ms Kirkby? Yes, I can. Yes, Mr O'Brien, ask your well-honed question. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. The, uh, so you can see from paragraph 90, and that's a Victoria statement, that, um, that Leslie had been removed from the, from the residence but was in, in, in the position for a short time whilst the existing manager was on leave. You see that? I do. And that was brought to your attention, was it not? It was. And, um, and, uh, and, and Wendy was then uh, removed from the position, is that so? No. Unfortunately, um, the residence that Mitchell lives in and the area that the staff member in question and, and what this email um, 
was advising, so what this email was about, um, briefly, was about um, where, um, the, it was about the new areas and it was about what area manager was in what area and what um, team leader was in what area. Now, the, the, um, the, the mistake, if you like, that was made here is the area that um, Mitchell lives in and his house are referred to as the same thing. So the staff member in question here never had direct reporting lines for Mitchell's house. There were alternative um, um, arrangements made for that house. Um, she has never had anything to do with Mitchell's house um, following, um, obviously, the events that were discussed, um, but is working in the area of the same name, if that makes sense. Certainly. Just going back one step to paragraph 89, you'll, you'll see from that paragraph that there was a time when Leslie, the former accommodation services manager, was acting in uh, Wendy, the incumbent's role for a month. You see that? Yes. And that was brought to your attention and, and she was removed, correct? Again, um, yes, Leslie was working in Wendy's position, but alternative arrangements had been made for the, um, for the oversight of the house and the area that Mitchell lived in. You can obviously see Victoria and James's concern as to the, the position being filled by Leslie. You, you understand that, don't you? I absolutely understand the concern, and when I spoke to... Um, when I spoke to clarified that, that there was no oversight for Mitchell's um, service by Leslie. And going back then to paragraph 90, you can see that when they received that generic email uh, associated with the name of the residence or the name of the place, however it was explained, yep. that that would have caused a great deal of concern and, and uh, indeed re-traumatise them as to, the, to the, the existence of that letter and the contents thereof, correct? Yeah, absolutely, and I apologised at the time for that confusion. The, um, the, um, the, the correspondence um, was not designed to cause any trauma to, to any family. I absolutely appreciate that it did, and I apologised then, and I apologise again today. Um, Indeed, you, you've, you've come to learn that the, the, the family, in particular Victoria and James, requested ministerial assistance in relation to this, this particular email and, and what it meant in terms of uh, particularly the safety for Mitchell, correct? Yes, absolutely, yep. I want to ask you about something you said in answer to Ms Ben. Right, so, Ms, uh, uh, have we not exhausted the topic, Mr O'Brien? Look, there's just, it, this arises from the evidence that, she, that this witness gave to Ms Bennett and it is relevant to this topic. If I... It, one, one more question. Thank I'm you. Sure. You said at page 178 of the transcript, when you were asked this question, the question was, you were the director while some investigations were being carried out, weren't you? And that was a question in relation to the investigations of the letter. Do you remember being asked that? Yes, I do. You responded, no, uh, I was the director with following on from the Ombudsman's recent report, but that was actually, yes, it was some time before I became director. Do you remember answering that? Um, yes. Well, you were the director from the 6th of August 2018, were you not? Uh, yes, I was. And the letter was the letter was sent and received, or at least received, on the 3rd of March 2018, was it not? The, if that's what you're saying, yes. So you were the director while some of the investigations were being carried out. In fact, most of the investigation was carried out under your directorship, correct? Um, I think the majority of, I mean, I would have to check records, but I would say that the majority of the investigation would have happened before August. That's, uh, that's my right. question. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, Ms. Eastman, do we now adjourn until 10 a.m. tomorrow, Adelaide time? Uh, yes, with one matter, you might recall in my opening I made reference to Section 6, capital M, of the Royal Commissions Act, and that is a provision dealing with injuries to a witness, and it extends to any person who causes any damage, loss or disadvantage to any person 
on account of the person having produced a document or given information or a statement to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commissioners take these provisions very seriously and can I remind people following the uh, conduct of this Royal Commission either in the hearing room or making comment online to be reminded about the effect of Section 6M. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Kirkby, thank you for coming to the Royal Commission and giving evidence. We appreciate uh, your attendance. I'm sorry to have kept you a little longer than perhaps we anticipated, but uh, thank you for your assistance. We'll adjourn now until 10am Adelaide time tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned. <laughs>